As the space shuttle program nears its scheduled completion later this year, the science aboard the International Space Station is gearing up for the next decade. When Discovery launches on NASA's 33rd mission to the ISS, the seven-member crew of STS-131 will begin a 13-day mission to resupply the space station. Packed inside the Leonardo multi-purpose logistics module in Discovery's payload bay are experiment racks for better exercise and in-depth Earth observations. The shuttle crew will perform three spacewalks to replace an ammonia tank assembly and a rate gyro assembly on the ISS and to conduct other maintenance work. STS-131 also marks a significant spaceflight milestone for the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency as two Japanese astronauts will fly on orbit at the same time. The astronauts on STS-131 will make up the last seven-member shuttle crew. Four of the astronauts have flown in space on previous missions, and three are first-time flyers. Navy Captain Alan Poindexter is the commander of Discovery. He last flew as the pilot of STS-122. This is his second space flight. Air Force Colonel Jim Dutton is the pilot for STS-131, his first ride uphill. He will conduct robotic operations with both the shuttle and station arms, and he will fly Discovery as it undocks from the station. Rick Mastracchio is Mission Specialist 1. He will serve as lead spacewalker during all three EVAs on this, his third spaceflight. Mission Specialist 2 is Educator Astronaut Dottie Metcalf Lindenberger. On this, her first space flight, she will act as the IV, the intravehicular officer, during the three STS-131 spacewalks. Lindenberger, the last educator astronaut scheduled to fly on the shuttle, will participate in two interactive educational events, where students will ask her about her mission and her past as an educator. She will also record several video segments on robotics for post-flight educational materials. Stephanie Wilson, Mission Specialist 3, is making her third visit to the ISS. She will be responsible for operating both the shuttle and station robotic arms. Mission Specialist 4 is JAXA astronaut Naoko Yamazaki. She is the loadmaster for the Leonardo Multipurpose Logistics Module, or MPLM, as cargo is transferred to and from station. Clay Anderson is Mission Specialist 5. He flew as an ISS flight engineer during Expedition 15 in 2007. During this mission, he will perform three spacewalks. STS-131 will fly the Leonardo MPLM packed with over four tons of equipment for transfer to station during the module's last round trip to the ISS. I think the biggest challenges on uh, STS-131 are to uh, be able to complete the transfer in the allotted time. Some hardware has constraints, so some hardware needs to be transferred in a certain order and in a certain way. One scientific addition to the station's Destiny Laboratory window is WARF, the Window Observational Research Facility. The new WARF instruments, including cameras, multispectral and hyperspectral scanners, camcorders, and sensors, will enable the ISS crew to photograph and study global climates, land and sea formations, and crop weather damage. Another ISS science rack delivered in the Leonardo moving van is the Muscle Atrophy Research and Exercise System, or MARES. The mares will help astronauts exercise seven different human joints and gauge their muscle strength surrounding those joints. The results will determine whether the countermeasures designed to prevent muscle atrophy are working. This mission will also mark the first time that two Japanese astronauts will be on orbit at the same time. JAXA shuttle astronaut Naoko Yamazaki joins Expedition 23 flight engineer Soichi Noguchi of the Japanese Space Agency. 
who will already be on station when Yamazaki arrives. Soichi and I are scheduled to do uh, several tasks together, like uh, experiment rock transfer and installation of the space station. So we are looking forward to working with each other. And we are also looking forward to sharing some Japanese cultures among the crew members. During STS-131, Mastrakio and Anderson will step outside the station for three scheduled spacewalks. Lindenberger will orchestrate the spacewalks as their IV, or intravehicular officer. A major spacewalking objective during this mission is to remove and replace an ammonia tank assembly on the station's S-1 truss. The swap out of the 1,800 pound tank, about the size of a standalone freezer, helps resupply the ISS thermal control system. As big as the space station robotic arm is, we can't base it in one place and reach all the way into the back of the payload bay, which is where the new ammonia tank assembly is, and then reach back over the back side of the space station's truss to where we're going to install it. So it requires three spacewalks. During EVA-1, Anderson will lift the new ATA out of Discovery's payload bay. Then, Wilson and Dutton will grapple the new tank with the station's robotic arm. They will attach the new tank to a temporary location on a POA, an attachment point on one of the station's mobile base systems. Next, Mastrakio and Anderson will remove and replace a rate gyro assembly, or RGA, located on the S0 truss. The first of the two RGAs, located on the port side of station, was swapped out during STS-128. The RGAs help stabilize the ISS attitude control systems. On EVA-2, Mastrakio and Anderson will disconnect the old ATA tank on the S-1 truss. Dutton and Wilson will grapple the old tank with the station arm and fly it to the front side of the truss, where the spacewalkers will strap it temporarily to a CETA cart, a small movable platform on the station. Then Dutton and Wilson will grapple and fly the new ATA tank that was temporarily stowed on the mobile base system to the S-1 truss where Mastrakio and Anderson will install it to station. During the third and final EVA, station arm operators Wilson and Dutton will grapple the old ATA tank from its temporary location on a CETA cart. Then spacewalkers Mastrakio and Anderson will secure the old tank in Discovery's payload bay. Before calling it a day, Anderson will install a camera on and remove a blanket from the special purpose dexterous manipulator. He will also remove the lightweight adapter plate assembly from the Columbus lab for the return home. I think the end of the shuttle program is a time to celebrate uh, all of the all the accomplishments, all of the uh, great work that we've done with the shuttle over the past 30 years. It's time to uh, to think about all of the uh, the great work and the great folks that worked on the shuttle program throughout the years. When I meet those folks, of course, the first thing I do is I say thank you, because without them we could not do this job. They sacrifice uh, weekends, holidays, and work long hours. We try to share the story of the mission and bring it home to them so they feel as much of a part uh, of the on-orbit mission as they can. Being an astronaut is a very special thing because in a way you represent those thousands of people when you're up there. It would not be possible to do uh, what, what an astronaut does without all the support that we get from, uh, from people across the agency and at our various contractors. Thank you very much.
Yeah, I gotta get out of your way because <laughs> they want to see you nut me. <laughs> All right, that'll work. Thank you for joining us here at a uh, very brisk NASA Kennedy Space Center's Launch Pad 39A for this media question and answer session. We're here with the seven astronauts for Space Shuttle Discovery's STS-131 mission to the International Space Station. I'll immediately turn this over now to the commander of STS-131, Alan Poindexter. Captain. Thanks, Howard. Uh, good morning. It's uh, great to be here in the Sunshine State. It's a little chilly, but uh, we're happy to be here, and uh, we're really looking forward to our training today and tomorrow in our terminal countdown demonstration test here on uh, launch pad 39A. And uh, Discovery behind us, uh, we were here the other night uh, when it rolled out to the pad. It was uh, just a beautiful sight and uh, great to see the uh, fruits of the labors of the, the uh, great folks here at uh, the Kennedy Space Center. We really appreciate all the, the hard, uh, hard work that went into getting Discovery ready to go. And uh, we've got a little bit of training left to do and we're ready to go as well. I'd like to uh, introduce the crew and I'll just pass the microphone down and they can introduce themselves and uh, tell you what they're gonna do on the mission. I'm Jim Dutton, a colonel in the United States Air Force, a pilot on the mission, and I'm from Eugene, Oregon. Hi, I'm Rick Mastracchio, originally from Connecticut. I'm MS-1 and one of the spacewalkers. I'm Dottie Metcalf Lindenberger. I grew up in Colorado and uh, taught in Washington State, and I will be MS-2 on the flight deck and be helping IVA for spacewalks. Hello, I'm Stephanie Wilson. I'm MS3. I'm uh, originally from Western Massachusetts, and I'm uh, one of the robotics officers. Hello, I'm Naoko Yamazaki from Japan. I'm MS4 and one of the robotics operator and a load master of the supply items. Hi, my name is Clay Anderson. I hail from the great state of Nebraska, and I'm the uh, second spacewalker. My title is MS5 on this flight. Uh, thanks very much, and uh, we'd be happy to take any questions that you might have this morning. Hi, I'm Nancy Atkinson from universetoday.com. And uh, with the slip of the launch, uh, you've had some extra time to do some training. I'm wondering what are the things that you've focused on and, and been appreciative of having the extra time? And then with it switching to a night launch, do you do any different in your training for that? That's a good, good question. Thank you. Uh, the question was... Uh, was uh, with a slip of the launch, do we do anything differently uh, because of a night launch and uh, what do we do with our extra time? We do add a little bit of training to our training flow. We have a great training manager back in Houston that's responsible for making sure that we get all of our objecti objectives accomplished. And uh, we added a little bit of training and some refresher training to stay current on all the tasks that we need to do. We're also taking advantage of a little bit of time off in the next few weeks to get some rest. Uh, the sleep shift is uh, probably the biggest thing that changed because of the night launch. We didn't change our training at all, but we do have to shift our uh, sleep schedule about uh, 12 or 14 hours, and so we've got that ready to go, and uh, we're really looking forward to coming back down here in a few weeks for our launch count. Hi, uh, Bill Harwood with CBS News. Let me ask uh, Rick a question first. If you could uh, give us maybe an overview of your EVAs from the 30,000-foot level, what the major priorities are, who's going to be on the arm, that sort of thing. Okay. I'll base the, uh, the overview uh, based on the temperature out here today. Yeah. We'll keep it short. <laughs> Yeah, EVA-1, basically we're going to take the, uh, a new ammonia tank out of the shuttle's payload bay and bring it over to station and temporarily stow it. We don't have anybody on the arm during that EVA, but uh, Jim and Stephanie will be controlling the arm and picking up the uh, ammonia tank. Basically, we're going to lift the ammonia tank out of the payload bay. Clay will be holding that 1,800 pounds over his head while the arm comes in and grapples it and then moves it over to station. EVA-2 is when we actually swap out the new ammonia tank for the old ammonia tank. That's where I'll lift up the old ammonia tank, hold that one over my head, while Steph and Jim come in and grapple it, and then we'll swap the two ammonia tanks, and we'll temp stow the old one on the, on the space station. And then EVA-3 is where we clean up the old ammonia tank, and we put it back in the payload bay, and then Clay actually gets on the arm at the end of EVA-3, and we go off and do some uh, several other small tasks with uh, removing some extra hardware off the space station, and uh, doing some work on the, uh, one of the Canadian arms. Thanks, and let me ask Clay a question if I could. Um, just your perspective uh, going to station, uh, what you're looking forward to uh, this time around, and I, I guess just mindset, you know, versus shuttle versus station. Uh, I think the best way to talk about the mindset of a short duration versus long duration, and a long is more like the marathon. You have to think of it as you're plodding along, you have to maintain your, the steady pace uh, throughout the entire effort, which was five months for me. 
Uh, for a shuttle, it's more like a sprint. We're going to hit, hit the ground running, and we're probably not going to stop running until we uh, undock with the station. I'm very much looking forward to going back home and seeing this International Space Station with all the new modules and all the new capability. And uh, even more than that, I'm going to see one of my old friends, Oleg Kotov, who is on the station right now, uh, not to mention Tracy Caldwell and then Stephanie Wilson, who I flew with before uh, on my first time. So I'm very excited to do, to do all this and looking forward to it. Uh, Todd Halverson, uh, Florida Today for uh, Dexter, I guess. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if uh, you could tell us what your reaction was to uh, the 2011 proposed budget with the idea of canceling the consolation program and how that went over in the astronaut office. Hey, good morning, Todd. Great to see you out here again. Thanks a lot for your question. As you know, we've been really, really focused on uh, STS-131, uh, ISS Mission 19A, and our training flow. And uh, we've, uh, we've uh, not had a lot of time to, uh, to think about, uh, about the proposal. And, uh, you know, it's uh, really w way above our level at this point. We're, uh, we're focused on our mission. We're happy to be here. And uh, we're ready to go fly Discovery. Thanks for your question. Can just hang on to the mic there. STS-131 is the uh, first of uh, the last four shuttle missions, and it's the first of the missions that um, really are all about outfitting the International Space Station. And I'm wondering if you could um, kind of uh, give us your ideas and your judgment on uh, how important these last four flights are to setting up the station for the long run. Yeah, it's a good question as well, Todd. Thanks. Uh, Critical, I'd say. I, I think it's really important that we uh, that we get these last uh, few remaining missions off. As you know, we're taking up the last uh, crew quarters sleep station for the uh, station crew. Uh, we've got a crew of six now on board when we get there, and it's important that we get the uh, to get the uh, station fully outfitted. We're taking up several science racks as well and a lot of critical supplies. And uh, looking forward to uh, seeing the cupola that, that our uh, friends installed there on the STS-130. Uh. I'm working at the Japanese TV station, so I want to ask by Japanese to Nako Yamazaki. I'm sorry about that. Nako san, ato iyo iyo ikkaket uchiagi ga semate ru wake desu ka? Ima no sotchoku na shinkyou o kikasu kudasai. Hai, uchiagi mada ato ikkaket. Ma kore kara saishu kunnen ni hagebu wake desu kere domo, matsu wa kyou to ashita no terminal rehearsal o sugoku tanoshimi ni shite imasu. De uchiagi no toki ni wa mo junbi bantan de bachiri to ii shigoto ga dekiru yo ni gamatte ikitai to omotte imasu. あのまさに後ろにまあ日本人が最後に乗るまあスペースシャトルが備え付けられているわけですけれども、そのシャトルを見てどのような思いが胸の中にありますか。はい、あの私たちあのクルー全員でスペースシャトルディスカバリー号が車上に移動するロールアウトに立ち会いました。でその時にあのウィアビハインジュディスカバリーというバナーを見てすごく感動しました。あのチームワークなのでみんなで一緒に仕事をしていきたいと思っています。非常ににこやかな表情に見受けられますが、今のリラックスした状況でしょうか。そうですね。あのみんなで今までずっと訓練をしてきたので、すごくあの自然な感じでいます。ありがとうございます。Thank you. As the question was, you know, the launch to, uh, you know, one must do the launch, and we were so, you know, I'm so impressed uh, to be here, and we, we are looking forward to the terminal rehearsal today and tomorrow, and I'm so, you know. Touched by the banner uh, hanging on the discoveries, we are behind your discoveries. So it's a teamwork. So we are looking forward to the great mission. Thanks. Hello, my name is Takao Ikeuchi from Kyoto News. I have a question for Yamazaki-san. Uh, as you know, uh, launch, uh, shuttle launch schedule was delayed due to the cold weather like this. So <laughs> does that affect your condition? Uh, はい、あの先ほど船長のコパインデクサーさんもあの言っていたように、あの何週間か余裕ができましたので、その期間にあのさらに訓練を積んで、でまあ準備万端にの状態でミッションに臨みたいと思っています。で体調に関してはあの本当クルーのみんなもそれから支えてくれている地上の皆さんもともにあの元気で頑張ってやっております。One more question. Uh, you are going to meet the Soichi Noguchi in space. Uh, this is the first time two Japanese astronauts meet in space. So could you give me a comment on that? Ano Noguchi Soichi-san to Uchiu de aimasu kedomo. Sore nitsuite eh to kanso o kikasai kudasai. 
はい、あの日本人2人同時に滞在できるということをすごく楽しみにしています。でそうですねあの日本人が2人というのは初めてのことですしこれから日本人がもっとですねあの国際宇宙ステーションそれからもっと先の、ね、ミッションで活躍できるその足場作りの一つになれればいいなとすごく楽しみにしています。Yeah, looking forward to、uh, you know, working together with Soichi Noguchi.、Uh, this is our first time to you know, have two Japanese on board. So, yeah, very looking forward to it. Thanks. Nancy Atkinson, university.com again.、Uh, could each of you just say what are the favorite things,、uh, part of the training that you do out here at Kennedy Space Center?、Uh, thanks for the question.、Uh, the, the question was、uh, what, what are the favorite things we,、uh, we experience when we.、Uh, We'll get, come in, get to the、uh, Kennedy Space Center. I think、uh, I was commenting to some of the, the, some of the folks that work here、uh, last night about、uh, what a great experience it is to come here at the Kennedy Space Center. The folks that work here is、uh, one big family and、uh, one great team. And、uh, I guess the, the thing I enjoy most is just interacting with those folks, getting to see the flight hardware, and,、uh, and spending time with the folks that、uh, get Discovery ready. I think、uh, for me, it's being near the flight hardware, getting to climb into Discovery、uh, for the first time during our, our、uh, CEIT training that we did back in January was pretty incredible. So uh, uh, enjoy being with the people as well. They're just、uh, wonderful folks out here. Yeah, I've had two space launches and I've done three spacewalks, but I'm telling you, the rollout of the space shuttle Discovery the other night was one of the most spectacular things I've ever seen. So that was incredible. I really enjoyed it. And、uh, like the others are saying,、um, I just love seeing the vehicle. It always puts me in awe. It's a, just amazing. And I also like when we come in and we fly over the pads and we can look out and see where、um, Mercury and Gemini and Apollo were and now where we are with shuttle and just thinking about the history and the point we came to today. So it just is always just amazing here. It is amazing to be here to、uh, meet the people that process our vehicle and see the flight hardware. Uh, we have an opportunity to train and learn how to drive one of the tanks that's stationed here at the pad. And so、uh, that's always a lot of fun. And it is very nice to face、uh, to the Discovery and also meet、uh, lots of people who make the Discovery you know, ready to fly.、Uh, my first time into space, I got moved from 118 to, to up to STS 117 and did not have an opportunity to do TCDT. And so this entire experience has been wonderful for me. And to have the opportunity to see the shuttle roll from the OPF to the VAB and then to see the entire stack roll out to the pad, it's just amazing. And I'm truly blessed. And、uh, I'd like to thank all the people that put this together because without them, you know, this program would be impossible. It's all due to the people and their dedication and their professionalism that we get to do what we get to do. So thank you very much. Uh, you can just keep the mic right there. I just have a real quick question for the loadmaster.、Um, MPLM, <laughs> flights <are> always <laughs> MPLM flights are always very busy. You have an awful lot of equipment to move back and forth. Can you give us kind of a little overview of what some of the big ticket items are or major items are and, and、uh, how you plan to execute that? Thank you. Yes,、uh, Stephanie Wilson and I are the loadmaster of the MPLM. And、uh, we will deliver、uh, the new crew quarters、uh, where the expedition crew stay. And also, we will deliver WOLF. Uh, which is a laboratory of the window observation facility, and some of the express racks and lots of you know, supply items to the station to keep the station in good shape. So, this is huge work, and it's also a teamwork.、Uh, Todd Halverson of Florida today for Dexter again.、Um, I'm wondering if you can talk about uh, uh, how important the terminal countdown demonstration test is to、uh, getting your crew and, and the KSC launch team、uh, ready for April the 5th? Yeah, good question, Todd.、Uh, it, it's, a, it's a great、uh, exercise. It,、uh, it allows us to interface with the flight hardware for the first time、uh, since our、uh, crew equipment interface test back in January. Obviously, the first time we've seen、uh, OV 103 out here on the pad. It allows us to get into the ship and then、uh, work with the launch team、uh, through, a, uh, through a simulated launch count. It、uh, allows us to exercise. All of the things that we're going to do. It also allow, it gives us an opportunity to do an emergency egress.、Uh, and, you know, in the rare event that we, we have something we had to get out of the vehicle in a hurry, it allows us to,、uh, to exercise those systems and, and see how all that works.
Okay, I think that's all the questions we have. We'll get you uh, back to your training. If we take a quick uh, photo opportunity with you, and uh, we'll get you back on your way. Thank you very much. Good luck with your training. You're from John Dillinger's hometown. Uh, well. Good afternoon and welcome to today's Flight Readiness Review News Conference for Shuttle Mission STS-131. We are pleased to be joined by NASA's Associate Administrator for Space Operations, Mr. Bill Gerstenmeyer. Evening. Space Shuttle Program Manager, John Shannon. And STS-131 Shuttle Launch Director, Pete Nikolenko. Good evening. We'll begin with some opening comments from the panel, and then we'll be happy to take your questions. Mr. Gerstenmeyer. Thanks, Mike. Uh, we had an extremely uh, thorough review today and uh, went through all the uh, the items with the vehicles and, and getting ready to go fly and uh, looked over the, the station hardware and this, the overall flight. Uh, again, an extremely complicated mission on orbit. Uh, lots of activities with the spacewalks. Uh, the ammonia tank transfer is, uh, is a real dance. If you look at how the, uh, you take the old tank off and you put the new tank on and you look at how those get moved back and forth, that's a, a real ballet of hardware getting moved around on station. Uh, again, just a tremendous amount of activity that will occur during the mission. The timeline looks uh, pretty good, pretty reasonable from an overall standpoint. Uh, it still accommodates the focused inspection and we still have a plus one day if it's needed at the end of the mission. So we looked at that in, in a lot of detail on the station side. On the shuttle side, we went through some of the issues that have shown up here uh, recently. Uh, uh, the helium isolation valve, the valve that's failed open, we discussed that in a lot of detail. Um, you know, basically why is it okay to fly with a valve that's essentially failed in the open position and, and the logic is, is simply that valve is typically open most of the time during flight anyway, so it's failed in a position that's pretty benign for us. We went through every failure case that could result in uh, any kind of off nominal operations if uh, downstream regulators failed, there's two of them. What would that mean to the, the pressurization of the tank? We looked if it had occurred the worst, tice, worst case time on orbit, these other failures occurred and things were still okay. So we went through very logically and methodically each of the conditions that occur with, could occur with this failure in the system and make sure that there's no uh, additional uh, risk that we considered unacceptable. We will be flying with uh, accepted risk, but the teams uh, reviewed that. Um, John talked to us, and, and we all agree that if we needed to roll back and slip, we could do that. That was not a was not a big deal to us overall. But the better part of our was to go fly. We're ready to go fly. The systems are there. We understand the failure well enough that, that it's okay to go fly with. And it's really we don't really understand what the failure is, but we understand the systems operations that we know we can go fly with this safely. So we reviewed that in detail. We reviewed some of the ceramic plugs that have, have come out on the windows, and, and again, that was a good review. So I would say it's an extremely thorough review today. We went through it uh, fairly methodically, and, and we're really ready to go fly. And it's, a, again, a tribute to the team down here at KSC to have got the vehicle processed and got it ready to go fly. So uh, again, a, a good review, and I look forward to your questions. And John? Okay, uh, I, I agree. Uh, the team worked uh, very well through all of our issues that we've had since the uh, Space Shuttle Program flight readiness in this review uh, two weeks ago. Uh, in addition to the uh, helium isolation valve that, uh, that Bill Gerstenmeyer just talked about, we, we had uh, talked a lot about one of these ceramic inserts, which is just a, a closeout piece of, uh, of uh, ceramic material that goes in the hole that you use to access the bolts to take off different carrier panels around windows and, and around the payload bay door hinge line. Uh, we had one that slightly came out on uh, the last flight, so we went and checked all of the accessible ones on Discovery out on the pad. That's all the ones around the windows and, and uh, around the crew hatch. Uh, we couldn't get to any of them on the hinge line of the payload bay door, so we talked very much about uh, whether that would cause a risk to us. We've never lost one in the history of the program. 
Uh, we had checked them all very carefully after the last mission of this vehicle, and we also checked the ones on Atlantis and Endeavor, and they, they looked good. So we had some good rationale to go fly with that, uh, even not being able to check all the ceramic inserts on this vehicle. So we felt that was a very good story. Uh, we also updated the board as a team on two issues that are not uh, real critical from the last mission. They've just been ongoing issues that we've been talking about. One was the ET uh, inner tank foam issue. We think we have a very good understanding of why that foam has been coming off, and, uh, and we reviewed that with the team. We also talked about the uh, reinforced carbon-carbon thermography tests that we do on the shuttle leading edge of the, uh, of the wing. Uh, the team has done an amazing job over the last two years in, in coming up with a, uh, a method to characterize that between missions and, and make sure that we don't have any issues at all. And the board, I think, was very appreciative of hearing that whole discussion. Um, there was some talk about uh, dissenting opinions on the RCS helium uh, isolation valve. And uh, we had a, a special, it's, it's called a Program Requirements Control Board, or a PRCB. That's the board that I chair. Uh, we had a special one on Tuesday just to kind of go through all of, the, uh, all of the discussion before we came to the agency flight readiness review. And I wouldn't characterize the, um, the comments on uh, changing the, the valve out as, as dissent. I think it was more uh, team members wanted us to, to make, sh they wanted to make sure that we had thought about a couple of things. And I would put it in three categories. Um, they, they acknowledged that, uh, that we were ready to fly with what we had but we needed to, to talk about being outside of our normal configuration. In other words, we do not have exact root cause for exactly why this valve is, uh, is failed in the open position. We won't have that until we get it back and take it apart. And have we thought through all the tests and, and all the different things uh, that could potentially uh, cascade downstream? We, we feel like we have, and, and that's the, the discussion we have with the board today. They also wanted us to talk about the impact to the team uh, when we launch with this. Uh, to make sure that this was not going to be a distraction to the team as the, the mission control uh, personnel are, are working through that issue and making sure that they're watching for any additional failures and that would distract them. And uh, we heard from mission operations on why that was not a concern. Uh, and the last one was, uh, was to talk about um, uh, whether we, were, we, we had schedule pressure, or whether we were, were uh, uh, pressing on with this flight because of a, a uh, uh, the the pressure of trying to finish out the program by the end of this year. And, you know, I, I give the speech several times a, a, a month, I think, but there will always be schedule pressure because we're trying to get an activity done, and you have schedule pressure in everything that you do, and the team is aware of that. The key on schedule pressure is don't let it make you do something stupid. And uh, that's the check that we need to do is we need to go through all of our rationale and make sure that we acknowledge that we have schedule pressure, but is it making us do something stupid? And that was what the, uh, what the team was working through. I, I had uh, laid out, just because of that, what our options were if we rolled the vehicle back. And we put together a fairly comprehensive plan that if we rolled back uh, the 131 vehicle to do the, the repair of this valve, um, it would not affect the shuttle program ending up uh, this year. We would still be able to fly all four flights within this calendar year. Uh, basically, what we would have done is is go ahead and launch 132 in its May time frame. We would slip 131 around it to July, and then slip the last two missions by about six weeks. And uh, right now, we're finishing up at the uh, end of September, so that would put us into uh, into November. Um, so far, the program is doing great this year. I, I could not be more proud of this team. Uh, from a hardware standpoint, we're really good to uh, to finish up at the end of this year. Our last flight external tank shows up here at the end of June. Uh, the rescue tank will show up in September. And uh, the last uh, solid rocket motor pieces are, are about to be loaded on railroad cars and sent out here. Um, the team is doing a wonderful job turning the vehicles around. So uh, overall, the team is, is doing extremely well. And, and I'm very proud of them. And I think we're going we're gonna to end up finishing very strong this year. That's it. Well, thanks, John. Uh, well, it's really great, and I'm really happy to be here at this point, uh, effectively a week from the start of the, of the shuttle launch countdown. Our processing at the pad is, in, is going on in, in great form. Uh, this past week, we've installed and connected the ord ordinance, installed and connected the payload, and performed the interface verification tests, and completed that today. We uh, just closed out the orbiter aft compartment and completed those confidence tests. So 
Uh, looks like almost everybody's going to be able to take this weekend off as we get ready to complete our preparations uh, next week for the c uh, countdown start. Uh, we'll, on Thursday, we'll get the uh, payload bay doors closed for flight after the flight crew performs their final sharp edge inspection. And then we'll be ready to start the shuttle launch countdown for next Friday the 2nd at 3 o'clock in the morning and uh, move on on uh, track for our launch attempt on Friday, the, or I'm sorry, on Monday the 5th. Uh, preferred launch time at 621 in the morning. Uh, in the meantime, our uh, launch on need vehicle processing for STS-132 is well on track. The uh, orbiter processing facility work is uh, right on schedule. Uh, we'll be performing the um, external tank mate Monday, this next Monday the 29th and uh, really on posture to support launch on uh, May 14th. So in, all, in short, this team is doing just what they, uh, what they love to do and what they're, what they're excellent at doing, and that's uh, keeping the processing work going and, uh, and making sure that we're running on all cylinders, which we are. Thanks. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. We'll um, take questions first here in Florida and ask you to um, wait for the microphone, identify yourself and your affiliation, and to whom you're addressing your question. Um, Marcia? Um, Marcia Dunn, Associated Press, probably for Bill. Um, what's the status of the alpha magnetic s spectrometer? What's the latest there, and how might it affect the uh, launch date for that mission? Yeah, it's currently at the, uh, <coughs> the thermal vacuum chamber in STEC. It's been installed in the thermal vacuum chamber, and I believe probably next week they will begin uh, the first cold run, series of cold runs when they take the chamber to vacuum. And then we'll get a chance to see how the, the uh, device is operating and see if there's anything that impacts where things go. So at this point, their schedule's been pretty much on track. They did uh, EMI, electromagnetic uh, interference testing in Europe, and that's all completed. It's all passed. That looks fine. We'll see if we get any unique results from the thermal testing. If we do, then we'll go see what it means from a manifesting standpoint or if there's any issues with the, with the flight and when it occurs. We're working a bunch of different options to protect things to see what variables are there, but other than that, we'll wait and see what the payload says and what they want to go do. They're also working some backup plans. So like always, we've got some things in work, and we'll see what the test data tells us in the next couple of weeks. We'll probably know kind of by the, probably the end of April about where the flight sits and where the payload availability sits. So their, their testing should be completed by then, and we ought to have the data reviewed and analyzed by that time. And um, also for you, um, the President will be visiting here next month, um, quite possibly in the middle of the shuttle mission. And um, are you welcoming that? What's, what's your, you know, are you pleased that he's coming to address workers or, we're, we're, you know? Uh, and do you fear that uh, it might be too much of a disruption during a mission, especially if he doesn't have exactly um, welcoming news? Again, our, our team's pretty mature. We, we don't have any details, really, of what <clears throat> what's going to go on with the visit. Uh, we'll let that happen. I think we're ready to go do what we need to do on orbit. The teams are pretty focused. And, and then folks are, are pretty, uh, you know, are, are really know what they need to go do, and especially during mission time frames, it's a good thing to stay focused on the mission and, and keep moving forward. So I don't see any impact there at all. Chris? Um, yeah, Chris Gebhardt with nasaspaceflight.com. Um, um, with just a couple questions. Um, first of all, um, the mission um, was recently switched to a descending node entry for landing, and I was just wondering what the thought process behind that was, and also for anyone who had um, an, any count on the number of ceramic inserts that were being looked at specifically. Okay. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the uh, descending node, the big advantages are to us that it, it allows us to help with a sleep shifting standpoint to the, to the crew on orbit. Uh, and that's an advantage to us. It also sets up when we have to close the hatch. So it gives us effectively about uh, another 24 hours or one 24-hour period of extra crew hours on orbit, which is, a, which is a big plus to the team. And then the other thing it does is kind of a secondary thing is also gives us a lighted landing, which is a nice thing to have. It puts landing, <coughs> or, you know, kind of around April, I think 18th, around 7 or so in the morning. So, so those are the big pluses. So the big pluses are it really gives us an extra 24 hours of transfer time. This is a pretty intense mission from a transfer standpoint. There's the MPLM as well as the EVA, so there's a lot of activity on the inside. So those 24 hours are pretty valuable to us. And then the lighted landing are, are the big things. And I think those are the, the two, two, two key things from the, from the descending landing. And it was reported at the uh, PRCB that there's 335 ceramic inserts per vehicle. Um, 
we did a very exhaustive uh, search to see if we'd lost any in the past. We've lost two, uh, one from the window area and one from the uh, upper wing carrier panel area. Uh, neither caused any, uh, any problems, but uh, we think that, that constantly taking the fastener out, you know, we swap windows out very frequently on the vehicles and uh, taking these little, f uh, the little inserts out to get to the bolts and putting them back in, that ends up putting some stress on those inserts. They can become unglued from the, uh, from the tile themselves. So uh, that was part of the rationale is you have 335 per vehicle. We've flown 130 times. We've lost a grand total of two. We really don't mess with the ones on the hinge line frequently at all. So we think that that's a, that was pretty good flight rationale. Bill? Uh, Bill Harwood, CVS, with just a couple of quick ones. Um, for John, on the ET foam in the inner tank, you said you understand. I assume that's this access issue and cleaning that you've told us about before. That's what you're talking about there? We've actually taken it a step beyond that. We think that the uh, root cause is the contamination on the uh, metallic surface that the foam is sprayed on that, that weakens the, uh, that bond. Um, but it's something beyond that. It's, it's how you have the ascent heating and then how that heating uh, is applied differentially to the top of those little stringer panels, the sides, and then the valleys of those stringer panels. You get a differential stress going on there that actually could, if you had a weakened bond, could actually lift up part of that, uh, that upper surface of the stringer. And uh, the team went over the thermal data. They ran some wind tunnel tests that showed when they come out and how they break up, and it was, uh, it was a pretty compelling story. Two more quick ones. You mentioned the folks who, you didn't call it dissent, but wanted to go off and look at those issues. What organization was that? And can I assume, just for the record, based on what you said, I assume today's meeting it was unanimous go. Is that correct? It, it was a unanimous go. Um, the folks that had brought up the concerns uh, felt like we represented those adequately at the flight readiness review. Uh, they were members of the uh, problem resolution team, which is a multi center multi-contractor uh, and civil servant team that, that looks at these problems and it was uh, a, a Boeing safety person and a SAIC safety person. Yeah. Thanks and one for Bill if I could. Um, th there has been talk in the past about a potential extra flight using the launch on need stuff for 133. Um, given that you don't know where AMS is going to shake out yet and how this is all going to play out, is there a drop dead date <coughs> to make an extra flight happen? What, when would you have to start that clock running? I mean from a crew training standpoint and everything else? We've, you know, in a way, we because we treat it as a contingency flight and, and kind of move in that direction, we've kind of protected for some of that. So, so we've kind of eased that uh, decision point so there, it's not quite as, you know, there's not a really a drop dead, dead, dead date kind of when we have to make that decision. So, you know, I think probably towards the end of April, first part of May, if we were going to do something there, we ought to know and we ought to start moving in that direction. So I think, again, when we start getting some, some data on AMS and understand where things fit, we'll take a look at all that, brief some folks, make sure that everybody agrees with the overall plan, and then probably in the May time frame, we're ready to kind of firm things up for the, for the home stretch as we, as we look at the remaining flights. Dan? Yeah, Dan Billow from uh, WESH TV. For John Shannon, a, a similar question uh, on the uh, using the launch on need tank. Are, how are you or, or are you uh, preparing to, in case you are told to fly a, a mission with that tank, what, if any, preparations are, are going on there? What have you been told? Well, the team approaches uh, that rescue tank ET number 122 like it's going to fly, and they need to because that is our rescue tank for the last scheduled flight. So no difference in the, in the preparation and the care that's, that's done or, or anything to, to prepare that tank for flight. Uh, doing anything else to actually add a, a mission or, or is that about uh, I about mean, that, that entire STS-335, which is the launch on need mission for our last scheduled flight 133, uh, is being treated just like a mission that is going to fly. That's the mindset we have to be in because we may end up needing to fly. <coughs> Jay? Jay Barbary with NBC. I have two questions, one uh, for John and one for Gerst. Uh, following up on the tanks, uh, uh, John, I've been told that you have two more that's been discovered by Lockheed. <laughs> you have a total of seven. Anything to that rumor? And if you want to answer that, then I'll follow up with another one. Do you have two more? Do you have seven tanks now? An ET would be a hard thing to hide. <laughs> There's an okay. Easter egg hunt for you, right? Um, so let me, you asked, so I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you the whole uh, ET story here. Um, 
we have uh, four flight tanks that are for the next four missions, right? Uh, so that's four. We have ET-122, which will be our launch on need tank that we were just talking about. Uh, we have talked about uh, bringing ET-94, which is a fully assembled tank, uh, but it's of the older design. It's called a lightweight tank as opposed to a super lightweight tank. Uh, we've talked about taking all the foam off of that and bringing it back. That would take, uh, take some period of time. So that's, uh, that's a sixth tank. Um, and then we have uh, piece parts for ETs 139 through uh, 140 and even some parts for ET 141. So, but they're not assembled into, into one big tank. They're, they're different piece parts where we've done some of the welding but not all of the welding on them. So it's fair to say that we have uh, five tanks that, uh, that could fly with no impact to the program at all, an older tank that would have significant rework associated with it, and then two additional uh, tanks that are in piece parts. Okay. And my second part of the uh, second question here for you, John. When you launch Discovery, <coughs> Discovery will be under the control of Mission Control Center in Houston, will it not? As all the shuttles have been? Sure. And the space station, when it's in action, as it is 24-7, you have astronauts on board. It is in control of ISS uh, Control Center which is a room adjacent to Mission Control, is it not? It's, uh, it's controlled not just from, uh, from Houston, but also from, from Moscow and, and the different parts the, the European part is from. And, and you have a Houston. planning room, I think, up at Marshall, too, don't you? Uh, we, there, yeah. It's a very distributed. Yeah, well, my point, my, point, my point is this. Sure. I was challenged last week on a couple of things of a report that I did. I used the term, Mission Control will go dark after the shuttle program. Now, the first time mission control was used was for Gemini 4. Until then, all the flights had been out of here with Mercury and Gemini 3. Gem mission control is a control center that covered, controlled all the Gemini, Apollo, and shuttle flights. ISS control controls the International Space Station. Now, when we launch American astronauts on board Soyuz, that will be under the control of the Russian Mission Control in Korolev. Now, if I'm wrong, tell me I'm wrong. And, and it is, but we follow along. Uh, yep, we follow along. Right. What I want to know, and I could not after I was accused of being wrong, <laughs> I could not find anybody to answer me out of Houston or had anything to say to me out of Houston. What role will Mission Control, not ISS Control, we all know that, what role will mission control have in any flights of American astronauts until we have another spaceship? Well, they have the, <clears throat> the same role essentially they have today. They'll follow along the Soyuz launch, coordinate with the Russian team and, and support in that sense. But it's not actual um, control and communications with the vehicle as it is uh, with the shuttle today. But Gerst, you're telling me you will have people inside mission control over there monitoring this flight. Yeah, we do today. You know, we're getting ready to go launch a Soyuz next week. In fact, I'm going to be going over to Russia on Sunday. There's a team in, in Moscow that sits in Korolev, a U.S. team that sits there and monitors along with the Russian control team. They follow along with the ascent checklist. It's not as involved as it is when we're running a shuttle flight. They're not sending the commands. They're not issuing the direct orders to the crew, but they're following along kind of in flight, following mode just for general awareness to make sure that things are going on correctly. And that, that stays the same as we continue on. So, so what you're saying is that they will, the mission control will be manned to monitor these flights when we have American astronauts flying. After we fly, after you fly the last shuttle, just um, I shouldn't say we, ISS I'm not team. flying it's anything, part of, but it's anyway. part of the ISS team, yes. Huh? Okay. Now, also, I, I use the term on the air that we've spent $10 billion on the Constellation program. I was chastised for using that term, and I checked it out with headquarters, and headquarters tells me that you've spent $9.4 billion. Also, what I was saying when I said it on the air, there's $2.5 billion in the President's proposal to shut down Constellation. That does not correlate with the contractor's shutdown price and their contracts they have with NASA. That amounts to 5 to $6 billion. 
I talked to the people in charge of this at NASA headquarters and they told me straight off, yeah, there's going to be probably litigation here. We don't know how much it's going to cost, but your figures are correct. So I said to them, I said, would, if I use the term on the air, that it would cost 12 to 16 billion dollars to finish out the Constellation program, would I be on money, would I be correct? And they said you'd be right on the money. Now the question, uh, if, Gerst, if you can help us on this. If it costs us six billion dollars to shut down Constellation, why wouldn't that buy us an Ares-1 rocket? Finished. <laughs> I know you, we, you ought to talk to headquarters. I, I, yeah, we'll have to. We'll I, have to. I don't I, think there's you, anybody here who can properly. It would be. It. You, no, no, I, I'm just saying. I'm trying to do my best job reporting, and I don't like it when I'm challenged on things that I know that I've got facts on. Yeah. Okay, that's and, all. And you should just consult with the Constellation program and headquarters would be a better source than, well, than they myself. Told me that. Okay. They told me that. But okay. My question is. My question is. If we spent 9.4 billion, we're going to spend another 6.4 something billion to shut it down, why don't we buy a rocket with that? That's, I mean, you, you can finish Ares 1 unless anybody wants to challenge me on it. Let's go to uh, Houston. We have some questions waiting there. Johnson Space Center in Houston. Uh, yes, Gina Sinceri, ABC News. Um, this is for John Shannon. John, I'm looking for kind of a more consumer-friendly liberal arts way to explain the concerns over the helium isolation valve. Can you help me with that? I'll try. <laughs> um, <laughs> Gina, to, uh, to um, let me think about good liberal arts. I'm just going to tell you. The, uh, so we have propellant in a tank that has to get to the little rocket motor, right? To, to push that propellant out, you have to pressurize it. And we pressurize it with helium. And um, what has failed is a valve between that helium tank and that propellant tank. So it's basically failed open. So you're, you're constantly feeding pressure into that tank, which for us is fine. That's exactly the way that we would like to uh, operate the system. Uh, to keep the pressure correct in the propellant tank, you have something called a regulator, which keeps the pressure not at the 3,000 pounds per square inch in the helium tank, but the 250 pounds per square inch you need in your propellant tank for your rocket to work correctly. And uh, so we have some regulators in there. Uh, the entire question was, what is our failure history on those regulators? If they failed, what would happen? Uh, do you have sufficient redundancy in the system? And after looking at all the testing that we did on it, uh, we're very confident that the system will work exactly like we expect it to, even with that one valve failed open. Did that help? Thank you, Thank you very much. Anything else, Gina? No, that's it. Okay. Um, also on the phone bridge, uh, we have Tarek Malik from Space.com. Tarek? Thank you. This is uh, Tarek Malik from Space.com and Space News, and I think I have one question and, um, and a follow-up. Um, my first question is for John Shannon. You mentioned earlier the, the confidence, even if you had to roll back uh, discovery and, and completing the manifest this year, as uh, planned. And yesterday there, there was a report uh, from the NASA Inspector General Office um, you know, saying that it, it, a, a slip in the, the manifest is likely to January or February. I'm just kind of curious if you, can, you could resolve that for us, kind of what um, space operations find, you know, what gives you the confidence that uh, uh, September or, or even December 2010 is, uh, is feasible. Thanks. I think the study you're referring to was more of a historical average. And, you know, there's a lot of things that have to go right to get a shuttle processed on the pad and launched. So, you know, I think it's still valid to look at historical data and, and determine whether, you know, whether you think you can make it or not. Um, you know, Tarek, we, we take each flight one at a time. The way I do my schedules, though, is hardware availability. Uh, can I get the hardware here to the Cape? Can I get it integrated? Can I get it tested out? Can I get it out to the pad? And, uh, and right now, that schedule looks extremely good. Um, the tanks are showing up uh, on time to support a, a last launch in September. The uh, solid rocket boosters are showing up in time to support that. The, the orbiters have been, uh, the last two missions have been virtually flawless, uh, no major issues at all. Um, could we have an issue that would, would cause us to delay? Of course we could. And, uh, and we almost had one here after, after you know, we, uh, we looked at it, we decided we did not need to roll back. Um, but even if we did have to roll back, we do have some flexibility. As the year goes along, as I get 
three, four, five months down the road here, that flexibility will just evaporate because it'll be be time behind you that you can't uh, you can't use. Um, so you know, I, I I can't dispute you know any anyone's prediction on when the shuttle program might actually uh, end, when we might actually fly our fourth flight. Um, right now, from a hardware standpoint, it looks extremely good to finish up in uh, in September. Thank you. And uh, my uh, second question is is for uh, you, John, or or uh, anyone who'd like to uh, take it. Um, if all goes according to plan, Discovery will be in orbit over the anniversary of the space shuttle program. Uh, and I'm just uh, wondering maybe what uh, you might think would be uh, in in store to commemorate that that anniversary, or just your thoughts on uh, flying the shuttle now, nearly 30 years later. Thanks. Uh, we have not planned. I got asked this actually in the uh, pre-flight press conference. We have not planned anything special uh, for that date. Um, that's we're still talking about what uh, what different things we might do. Um, as far as what it means, the shuttle has an amazing legacy and um, spanning all the way from from uh, uh, from some of the early DoD missions, the planetary missions, the space. I mean, you know, we don't talk about those things very much because we're so. ISS focused and, and somewhat Hubble focused in the last uh, decade, um, but all of the the space lab missions that really opened up how to do science in space, um, the the different Earth observation, the material science mission, all those different things that the shuttle has done. I like to think the legacy of the shuttle is uh, is that amazing space station that we have up there right now, uh, and the uh, the uh, ability to fix the Hubble Space Telescope and then upgrade it to the incredible machine it is right now. But over 30 years, you, you can't lose sight of uh, all the different things the shuttle has done. Wayne Hale is is working with team members to put together a book of the history of the shuttle. And I, I was walking out to the parking lot with him, and he's just he's got thousands of pages. And it's just how do you how do you wrap your arms around 30 years of uh, of groundbreaking uh, space activities that the uh, the shuttle has uh, has given to this nation? And, and even today during the FRR, we were watching the EVA video. <clears throat> and we were watching all the activity of where the crew members are going to move the ammonia tank and install a, a grapple fixture to install a rate gyro assembly. And we look at the complexity of that EVA, and we kind of all looked at each other across the table, and we kind of envisioned back at the beginning of the shuttle program. And we all looked at each other and we said, could you imagine that we would ever be talking about any kind of complex activity like we are seeing in this video and think we're about ready to go do this again? So what the shuttle has really done for us is it's shown what we can do in space, well, how we can work as a team internationally, and how we can assemble an amazing structure with just a tremendous amount of work. So it was kind of a, a moment for all of us as we just saw the EVA activity to, to think back for a minute of how far we've really come in terms of space operations and activity starting to become uh, not routine, but, but at least it, we, can, we can comprehend that we can actually go do this with some margin. Become familiar. Yeah, familiar is a better word. All right, back here in Kennedy Space Center with James Dean. James Dean from Florida Today, uh, first for Ms. Shannon. Um, I'm a little new, I guess, to the, this descending node issue. Um, can you talk about the added risk, if any, that that poses um, relative to the ascending option? And just in general, you know, how, how common is it um, or how unusual it is, is it for you to, 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 to take this route? Well, post Columbia, we were uh, very um, deliberate in trying to determine risk to uh, to people on the ground if we had a, a vehicle breakup, and we did some some uh, extensive modeling of uh, what debris um, uh, envelopes would be created for different vehicle breakups and then you you know it's a it's a difficult thing to talk about it but it's important work that we do and so then you you take a look at the ground track of the vehicle and you look at the different debris footprints for breakups at, at different altitude and then you sum all that together and you come up with a certain risk to uh, to the population uh, and we set those numbers and what we have done here is is um, is take a very close look and make sure that the uh, descending node opportunity, which will go over the United States, does not put any major population areas at risk, and that our uh, general population uh, risk is uh, below those limits that were that were set. In uh, post Columbia, we typically did ascending uh, node um, 
uh, landings, but uh, we looked at these descending nodes and they also met the criteria. So the significant advantage you get for the crew timeline uh, really said that this was the right way to go, as long as we could meet our safety criteria. And, and we've done one other uh, descending uh, entry since return to flight. Right. One other than the one we've got planned here. Right. Uh, Mr. Estimar, just lo looking at the final four missions as a whole, the focus obviously is, is resupply and, and, and getting the, the spares up. I wonder if you could just talk about the importance of, of that broader mission, if you will, for the, the remaining flights. Um, and then specifically, um, is that going to set you up to, do you think, for to, to, to 2015 um, station lifetime in terms of the, the ORUs, or are you expecting that to get you out as far as 2020? Um, and uh, if the C first CRS flights are, are delayed past next May, which seems likely, um, at what point is your six crew operation um, become threatened if you don't get more supplies? Yeah, to, to, you know, again, we've we've pretty much set the manifest for the remaining flights in terms of spares, and things are working, you know, pretty much as we've planned. It, it turns out this this flight, getting the ammonia tank assembly uh, moved, is is one of our critical uh, crit one items. Or in other words, it's one of the most important items in the mission, and it actually drives the minimum duration flight discussion to be about 11 days to get the tanks switched and moved. So what that shows you is how critical it is for us to get this tank the new tank positioned on board station. So that's a very important thing for us. So that's a sense of how important these spares are that we're taking up. The other thing we're doing on this flight, we're also carrying a bunch of research racks up, uh, you know, the window observation facilities, some other things that'll fit in, the, that are in the MPLM. Those are also important to set up the research side. So we're not only setting up the sparing side, but we're also setting up station for research. So I think these flights are pretty critical. We've got the right spare set. We're also still troubleshooting a lot of uh, systems on board station. Uh, you, you know, you'll hear about the water processor. It's currently not operating. It's a system that purifies the water uh, for drinking. Uh, we're flying up a spare on this flight to go get that uh, fixed and repaired. What's important is we need to learn what's wrong with those systems. There's some things that are small. There's some uh, some uh, biofilm that's forming in valves with very small clearances. There's some gas bubble problems we're seeing. There's some filter problems. We didn't really know how to design this hardware at the beginning because we, you know, we did as good as we could, and now we're actually working those bugs out. So this is important for us to have the shuttle around for these couple of flights so we can get these water systems and get the life support systems up and operating and, and working in a fine way. So we're working out those first initial problems with new systems that you bring online just like we planned and, and all that's going fairly well mm -hmm. along and it's looking pretty good for our overall schedule. This sets us up for having all the big spares on board station, control moment gyros, ammonia tanks, all those things that, that we need. Um, then the commercial resupply services folks, we need those folks as soon as they're ready to fly. We can, you know, we really want them in 11. Uh, we've got some softness in the schedule if they slip you know, till later in 11 or into early 12, we're probably okay. You know, beyond that, it becomes more problematic depending on what fails. So we've done as good as we can with the remaining shuttle flights. We've optimized things. We've put things in place, and and we're really kind of set up as good as we can. And it's a it's again a tribute to the station team that have done this planning to get these logistics ready and, and prepositioned. Uh, so just just to confirm, you, you can get all the way through 11 with six crew, uh, no impact to. You know, crew and operations. Uh, if there's no CRS before them, again, it's it's tough. It's it depends what things happen on station. If anything fails or whatever, we you know we assuming everything is probably proceeding the way it is, or maybe a little better than the way it is. So it gets kind of there's not a there's not a black or white answer of after this date it's not good. At this date it's fine. It's a function of how the systems perform on board station. So, so we'll see how things are going. So far, things have been going very well. We have probably um, less failures than we've anticipated in our planning. If that continues to hold, then that maybe even gives us a little bit more margin. But we'll just have to watch things and see how they progress and then move forward. Chris. Um, Chris Gebhardt with NASASpaceFlight.com again. Um, a couple weeks ago, um, you had um, some failure indications inside the um, or in the PCMMU. Um, on board Discovery, and I'm just wondering what the troubleshooting um, troubleshooting efforts found, and if anything was done for that. And I've got two more follow-ups. Sure. The uh, 
pulse code master modulation unit that uh, it takes uh, signals from various um, uh, multiplexers, puts them in a in a configuration that can be downlink so we can get our data. Basically, it's it's the box that sends data uh, from the different uh, pieces of the orbiter to the uh, to the folks here in the launch control center or to the mission control center, and um, it. You know what, I'm going to stop and I'm going to let Pete take this because Pete's been sitting here doing, being very patient <laughs> with us and he knows everything there is to know about the Puckamoo. So, well, I don't know if I'd so say that, Pete, go get him here. Well, it, it, in short, there was uh, a couple of uh, built in test equipment bite um, indications that we saw that occurred uh, in effectively randomly in three occasions over the course of a few days. And, and, and over extensive troubleshooting we we hooked up a bunch of uh, different breakout boxes and and data recorders in various configurations and we're not able to replicate the uh, the anomaly so effectively it is what we consider to be a an unexplained anomaly however that uh, that PCMMU is still considered to be good because it was just isolated and we have verified that the functionality of the of the box is just the way it, the way the way it is that we intend it to be uh, we will, however, however, though, fly on the other PCMMU box, number two, um, and we'll launch in that configuration and expect to remain in that on orbit. But there is certainly that uh, we certainly do not consider the unit number one failed. And in short, that's probably the best way to characterize it. Okay. Um, and the second of two questions I've got, um, you know, Discovery's taken up the MPLM Leonardo on this flight, which is the same flight module scheduled to be um, converted into the PMM for the 133 flight. Um, and I know back when this mission was scheduled to launch on March 18th, there was already some concern about um, the schedule and getting that, getting the, getting Leonardo reconfigured. i uh, just wondering what the status of that is and if there was any serious consideration given to switching uh, to Raffaello for the PMM on that final flight. I think the teams have looked at it, and uh, I think we're still okay with this MPLM to get converted. There's still enough time to go do it. So some of the, the work that needed to be done had to be done by Alenia, and so it can be done offline. So some of the blankets and some of the mod kits are going to get developed and built, and then when the MPLM comes back, the schedule shows that it all fits in and all the work can be done. It can get completed, and it can be supported to get the right modifications in to, to support the flight in the in the fall. So it it all it all fits when you lay out the schedule. I know there's been again like we always talk about. We look at a couple of contingencies down the road. So I, I think the teams have probably gone off and looked at using one of the other MPLMs. But right now, unless this flight moves dramatically, we'll stay with the same plan that we've got on the books today to outfit this uh, MPLM. Um, and just a really quick one. Um, in, in, in terms of Ames, I know you ha you said you won't know anything until uh, late April on it, definitely. But um, with Ames being the payload on a 134, which is the launch on need for 132, um, I was just wondering if, if if we do run into a problem with Ames, what that would do to your ability to launch Endeavor in the 134 configuration, and um, it, at what point how far out would that mission have to slip before it would start affecting the CSCS requirements for 132? Yeah, again, it, it's this is not an easy answer because the, the launch on need yeah, reflects, uh, you know, what crew size is on the mission and then what the system status is on board space station. It turns out station's pretty robust now from a water standpoint, uh, from an oxygen generation standpoint, if we can get the water processor behind us. The carbon dioxide removal system, we have two of those now on the U.S. side. We used to only have one. Th those are both functional now. We think we just did a change out of some sensors on orbit to, to regain one of them. So, so if all that's healthy, you can have a pretty significant period of time between the flights between when the shuttle needs to be ready and, and how long you can keep crew on orbit. So I don't know the exact date. I, I think they've looked at it, but it, it can slip a couple months and still still support its uh, need for CSC or for contingency crew support. Bill? Uh, Bill Harrod, well, let me just follow that. I have two, uh, for uh, one for Bill and one for John maybe. But for Bill, can you refresh my memory on what your funding requirements are for flights if you slip past the end of the calendar year I don't I, you told us this once before but I just if flights do indeed go there for whatever reason do you need to go get more money to make that happen yeah where we are right in in the president's budget we just received we have an additional 600 million dollars to fly the first quarter of fiscal year 11 so that gets us uh, from October November and December 
So it roughly costs us about $200 million a month to fly the shuttle. So it would be about the same if we go beyond the January time frame. And in this budget, we have funding to go all the way through December. And then beyond that, it's roughly about the same amount, roughly $200 million a month. Beyond that, you'd have to go, Congress would have to give you guys some more money if you don't get done in the calendar year. We would need to seek some additional funding to go do that. Thanks. And on AMS, and I'm not trying to beat a dead horse, and I, I, I understand your reticence to talk about that, I guess, but everybody that talks to us thinks that flight, that payload's four to six months down, and I've been around long enough to know that initial estimates are always wrong, and it's probably not anywhere near that, but since everybody seems to be saying that, there must be something going on. And I was just trying to understand if you can tell us anything about that, because it doesn't sound like it can make July. Again, uh, well, the, I'll explain a little bit of the problem, but uh, again, it's probably better that you actually talk to the AMS, you know, payload investigator themselves. But the intent of the AMS is to operate for three years to look at dark matter, and, and it needs, a, uh, it has a superfluid helium that keeps a a superconducting magnet cool, and that essentially uh, takes the particles, the high energy particles from space, and then puts them through a detector on the on the payload. So this superfluid helium has to remain superfluid and stay below the uh, superconducting temperature of the magnet for a three year period. So as you can imagine, predicting the heat load of that superfluid helium to ensure you have enough helium to stay at this condition, four degrees Kelvin for a three-year period is not an easy calculation. It's extremely sensitive to what uh, conditions go into that. And the only testing that they've been able to do so far is testing in ambient conditions with a simulation on the outside. So until they really get in a thermal vacuum chamber and then see what the external environment does to this superfluid helium and how well that conducts and how well that system operates, it, you're really speculating on whether this device will have enough a lifetime to get three years of uh, data taking or, or not. So, so once they get the thermal vacuum data, then they'll have a better understanding of what the life is. And it, and it's just the sensitivity of the calculation. So, what you're hearing is folks that are that are preparing for the worst, like we always do. You know, we're, we're preparing in case we got to make some major modifications to the payload. That's where you're seeing the discussions. Then there's another group that says, based on the thermal calculations, if the the thermal vac test comes in fine. The magnet may be okay in its current operation with no modifications and nothing required. So, so that's why I, I don't really want to speculate one way or the other because it's really tough to call at this point. Let's get the data. The data will be pretty obvious which way we're going to go, and then we'll be ready to go support. And in any case, we're all working contingency plans in case the data comes back in the most constraining case, and that's where you're hearing the payload estimates and the and discussions you're hearing on the dates. Dan? And Dan Billow, with two more questions, please. Uh, first one for John. If, if policymakers decide to uh, to add more shuttle flights, including the the launch on need tank and, and possibly even one of the other, one or more of the other tanks that you mentioned or potential tanks, uh, first is is that the cost two hundred million a month? I assume that pl pays to keep everybody uh, on the job. And and how long would it take to get one or more of those three other tanks, not including the launch on need? Uh, ready to fly, roughly. It, I'm glad you said roughly because it'll be roughly. The um, the first question was 200 million a month. That pays for operations cost at our current flight rate. Um, it does not pay for much in the way of production costs. So if we were going to do significant new production, bring vendors back on, uh, start building tanks, which would require some hiring out at uh, out at Michoud, um, that cost could go up. Now, if you reduce the flight rate, the cost could go down. So it's, it's, a, it's a balancing act there between how much money you have, how much you want to go fly, and, and, and how you would space out the flights. Um, the second one was how, how quickly could you get uh, tanks ready to go fly for additional flights? Of course, 122 will be available to us. It'll be ready to fly as early as uh, November of this year. Uh, ET-94, it would take significant rework. We would go strip all of the foam off of it, uh, reapply it with new uh, methods that we've uh, been, uh, have put in place since return to flight. Uh, so it would be at best mid to late 2012. Uh, the tanks that just have initial welding on them, I think would be late 2012 to, to the early 2013 time frame. And uh, a final question for me for Bill Gersten Meyer. Uh, on Constellation, can you give me an estimate on what it will cost to shut down 
constellation and any rough estimate you can give me and and tell me also why does it cost a lot of money to shut down a big program I don't really have the details on the cost estimate I think you can look in the president's budget and there's some budget numbers that are out there and I don't I don't want to quote them from memory, but you can go look in the, the online uh, budget numbers of what's, that's what's allocated there. And, and what it is is I think it's just closeout costs. It's similar things that we're doing with the shuttle program. As we, as we close things out, you, you have to do something with the tooling, something with the hardware, something with the, um, even some of the personnel. You have some severance, other things. So all those things are costs that then are considered part of closeout. So as you disposition tooling and hardware materials you've purchased, you have to store those, put them in place. You want to keep records. You want to make sure that when you close out a program, you've kept all the pertinent data so that if you're going to do another similar program in the future, you've got that data captured and you've got that equipment around. So there's a, there's a, you know, a fair amount of cost associated with, with closing out or ramping down a program. And, and in the case of shuttle, we've been really doing that very gradually over a, a three-year period here. And, and we're continuing to do that in small little pieces. And, and that's, so you've even seen some costs in the shuttle program for what it takes for us to terminate and, and close out the shuttle program. Two things you don't think about very much is the hardware the contractors have bought to execute the program. Well, you need to you need to pay them for that, and even if the depreciated cost, you have to pay uh, that. And environmental cleanup is uh, from a shuttle program standpoint, that's a significant cost to us. Different areas where we've been producing or testing or anything else, we have to take the environment back to its original condition, and, and we pay for that. Jay, uh, follow up on my original question there, John. I was under the impression that the uh, Soyuz flights in the p past with our guys on board have been monitored from ISS control rather than from mission control. Now, am I wrong on that? Uh, you were talking about possibly, Gerst, about putting up mission control with people on it, but haven't we been doing it in the past from ISS? We, we've done it from both. We have a, a team in Houston that, that follows along what's going on, and then we also have some specialists, the Houston Support Group, it sits in essentially a back room in Moscow that also follows along there, there, and they follow along the, the on-orbit operations. And then we send a team of, of specialists over that are, have special skills with ASCENT. They've been through the crew training for the Soyuz activity, as we have a flight engineer, too, and they've, they've been experienced in Soyuz operations. And they're there. They follow along with the mission. They listen to the, uh, to the Russian flight control team. Uh, talk to the capsule, uh, and they understand the basic systems. They follow along with checklists, just like our checklist during ascent. But, but so, the so it's in both places. But the bottom line is, Gerst, that Korolev is a control center in charge of uh, yes. Soyuz, and yes. we're at, we're playing an av advisory role here yes. and there. Yes. And also uh, for John, there's several politicians that tell you they've already got the fifth mission promise from the president. That's one of the things he's going to give us down here. Plus the fact that it, there's a pr plan out there among when, within Congress and the Senate to keep shuttle flying into 2013 using the two additional tanks that you'd have to repair and get, get the new foam on, et cetera. And if, if they were able to sell that plan that we could keep flying until 2013, SpaceX officials are very convinced that they can have Dragon ready to fly astronauts in three years. In fact, their president guaranteed it before a congressional uh, board this past week. Now, the, uh, what they're putting out there, they're saying if we keep shuttle going with seven more flights into 2013, that we won't have a gap there. And I believe we bought, what, six seats on board Soyuz? Is that correct, Bill? Is it six or eight? We we buy seats usually six at a time for So we purchase six. Yep. Yeah. Okay. At fifty one billion I mean million or fifty four million. That, that was the last price was around fifty million dollars. Uh, but but going back to this, you're talking roughly two billion dollars a year if you got a uh, additional three years and try to fly out what these people are talking about doing, you're talking uh six you'd have to have six billion dollars more really to keep shuttle going until Dragon's ready to fly. Is that right? Oh, oh, okay. I was, <laughs> I was looking for the question. Yeah. Um, help me. Okay. You're talking $200 million yeah. a month. 
Okay. okay. I, let me just say, Jay, what the shuttle program is doing is is we're uh, we are preparing uh, heavily to fly these four flights this year. Uh, we have not received any other direction at all. Um, we are preparing the STS-122. Uh, I'm sorry, the ET-122 STS-335 mission like it's going to fly. Uh, we have not received any other direction beyond that. Um, I know there's a lot of discussions out there, but uh, the shuttle program is not, uh, we're not executing any alternative plans. We're not really preparing for anything else. And uh, we'll just stand by and, and see what, uh, what they want us to go do. comes down and shakes everybody's hand and says, okay, you sold me. We're going to go fly this. We'll do this because America won't be without a spaceship until we have another one ready to go under this plan and everything like that. The bottom line is if they give you the money, you could do it. Uh, That's my question. That, that generally is always true. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay uh, James, did you have a question? Right, James Dean, Florida today. A couple more. Uh, Ms. Shannon, you might have already answered this indirectly, uh, talking about the tanks and the dates and stuff, but during the pre-flights you mentioned uh, an another study being in progress that you expect to be briefed on soon about you know, vendors and sub-vendors, and just wonder if there's anything new out of that that, that added uh, confidence or, or you know, limited your abilities at all that you found out so far? We did. Uh, we finished the study. What, what uh, is being referred to was a, um, we went and touched base with all of the, uh, the different suppliers and vendors that support or supported the shuttle program back when we were in, uh, in full production to determine whether they could be brought back online. And uh, the results of that were as expected, that uh, they could be brought online. It would, uh, it would take some period of time like we had, we had talked before. And uh, Mr. Nikolenko, um, any m margin for getting to April 5 if there's a spate of bad weather or some crops up? Any, how much do you have? And, and uh, last, time, last countdown, we were talking about the Super Bowl this year. Uh, this time, I guess it's going to be uh, Easter. Any special concerns related to uh, working around a holiday like that? Well, first, uh, this weekend uh, we, we do have two contingency days, and we do intend to take, uh, by and large, uh, this entire weekend off, just a little bit of work tomorrow. Uh, beyond that, once we get back to work on Monday, it's following the schedule and, mo and moving towards, uh, you know, starting the countdown on Friday. So I wouldn't say that there's any contingency beyond that. But but that's, that's standard work, and there's, I don't expect any issues there. Uh, now, with regards to the countdown taking place on, you know, on Easter Sunday, you know, the day before launch is typically a very busy, you know, launch countdown day, and, and there'll be lots of folks out here doing that work. And the schedules and the personnel, everybody's set up to do it, and there, there have been no complaints. So I think we're anxious to, to get on it. Okay, we'll take one more question from Chris, and then we'll call it an afternoon. Okay, uh, Chris Gubber from NASASpaceFlight.com again. Um, just wondering on the T-seal discussions on the RCC, what was seen to kickstart that discussion? Yeah, I guess on the last flight, uh, we saw uh, we've been the team has been tracking imaging of the entire RCC wing leading edges, and they they saw a panel 9R, I think, right? Uh, that the T seal. The T seal that had a small indication on it. They then, after got back in the OPF, went and poked on it a little bit, and they've been tracking it all along. And, and lo and behold, it actually a little piece came off. This isn't the same thing we've seen before, where we saw the spallation. This was a different piece. There was some probably mechanical damage that started out and then over time it was oxidizing and then they've been tracking it all along. So then we just wanted kind of a general overview of what's going on with RCC, what's the current status of all our panels, are we tracking any other indications? So I asked John and the team, could you kind of give us just an overview of where we are? They had completed a, a three-year extensive study on the, uh, the joggle region, the slip side where the RCC panels come. And they had just completed that report, so they gave us an overview of that report and the findings. And it's, it was a tremendous effort by um, multiple folks throughout the agency, people from, from Glenn and uh, the NESC and JSC and Marshall. It, you can't believe how many people are involved in this report that actually did a tremendous amount of analysis to, to understand what's going on with RCC. So they gave us a very nice summary of that. They showed us what they've been tracking on all the vehicles. They showed us the status of the RCC panels, and, and those are the kind of things. So it was preempted by this little, really them doing their job and them detecting, hey, here's a panel that needs to get pulled off and get repaired. And then we just asked for a little more data, and they gave us a very good presentation. So that's what that's what 
kicked all that activity off. And John, would you add anything? Uh, no, I, I think uh, what it, this was on a, the mechanical damage that oxidized was on a T-seal, which you have a lot of thermal capability on a T-seal, not, not on the panel itself. But what it did is it proved the tools. Uh, our ability to track from flight to flight to flight any growth of any, uh, I hate to say even defects, but any areas on a panel or a T-seal that uh, you need to pay attention to. And, uh, and I, I could not feel more confident in the tools that we go and fly with. All right. Once again, launch officially is targeted for April 5th at 6.21 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. The next mission milestone for STS-131 is the arrival of the flight crew here at Kennedy Space Center on April 1st at approximately 7 in the morning, and that will be shown live on NASA television. Thank you all very much for coming. I uh, we'll also invite you to uh, keep track of the mission activities on the NASA website at www.nasa.gov shuttle. Thank you. Good morning. 
It's a beautiful t morning here at uh, the Kennedy Space Center, and uh, the crew is very happy to be here, as you can see. We, uh, we had a, a uh, short uh, flyby of the pad and uh, saw the good ship Discovery out there, and it looks great, and, uh, and we're ready to go. Uh, just a short uh, 96 hours from now, uh, we should be launching, and uh, we wanted to uh, thank the uh, dedicated team of professionals down here that's been working uh, so hard for the past several weeks to put the final, the, uh, final touches on the vehicle and uh, get ready to get into the uh, launch countdown early tomorrow morning. The, uh, the crew's ready to go, and uh, we're looking forward to our, uh, to our mission to the International Space Station. It's a, a complex 13-day uh, mission. Its uh, main mission is resupply. We also have three very challenging EVAs. I've got a dedicated team of professionals here that, uh, that's going to go out and uh, do those things, working with the uh, ground back at, uh, in Houston. We've got uh, seven racks to deliver to the International Space Station, including uh, four research and science racks. And uh, we're looking forward to getting those on board and uh, getting them ready to go. I'll let the uh, crew come up and say a few words to you about uh, who they are and what they're going to do. And uh, first up will be the uh, pilot, Mr. Jim Dutton. Thanks. Well, it's hard to believe it's been uh, over a year now that we've been preparing for this mission, and uh, it's just great to be here uh, this week, just four days out from launch. Um, we, uh, we really want to thank the group of people back in Houston who have worked so hard to prepare us for this mission. Uh, they've put in a lot of extra hours. They show up before our training events. They stay after we leave. And uh, when we have questions or are looking for additional information, they're always there to, to make sure we get what we need. And, and so uh, we're ready, as Dex said, to go fly. Thanks. Hi, Rick Mastracchio, MS-1. Looking forward to a great mission, and especially the EVAs. With the end of the space shuttle program, it will be a rare event to get the opportunity to actually build something in orbit. And it's an incredible experience that I'm looking forward to again. Uh, it takes a, a lot of folks to prepare us. So I'd like to say thanks to all the EVA folks who prepared us, the trainers, the folks at the NBL, and all the folks who've prepared the hardware and gotten it ready for us for this mission. It's, uh, we appreciate all their efforts. Thanks. I'm Dottie Metcalf, Lindenberger, and I'm MS2. And I'd like to thank the folks that, uh, the systems that we use every day on the shuttle that sometimes we don't, um, people don't know that we're using them. Uh, for instance, the, the computers that we use on board are just normal laptops, but they get us through rendezvous. They help us to know where we are as we're orbiting the Earth. Um, they let us visit with our families at least once while we're on orbit. And uh, they just make daily life a lot easier. And also, as all of you are using cameras out there, we have a great photography team that lets us capture this amazing experience that we're going to go off and do. So I'd like to thank them. And I'd also like to thank the uh, teaching um, group that's uh, mostly in Houston, but also across all of the centers, as I know that they've been preparing lessons for teachers to use across this country in robotics. So thanks to all of those folks. Hi, I'm Stephanie Wilson. I'm MS3, and I'm excited to be here for, to start the launch process for SCS-131. Uh, for the robotics teams, we'd like to thank both the shuttle and the space station robotics teams uh, for all the preparation that they've given to us, uh, for working with our spacewalking teams and all the coordination that goes into that, for the uh, instructors, for the mission designers, and also for our uh, flight controllers. They have done a wonderful job preparing us, and we're ready to go execute the mission. Thank you. Hi, uh, Naoko Yamazaki, MS4, and so glad to be here. Uh, as a load master, I'd like to thank a Space Shuttle Transfer Team and Space Station Teams, all the payload teams, and uh, the Kennedy Space Center Hardware Processing Teams and Italian uh, Space Agency who built Leonardo Multi Logistics Purpose Module. We've been working so close together so that we can have a good plan for the transfer. 
And uh, I'd like to uh, deliver each piece of hardware and execute each piece of activities with all the dedicated people in our sorts. Thank you so much. So, 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 えー、このミッションでロードマスターとしてまあ6トン以上の物資、日本の実験装置もたくさんあります、運びます、その時にたくさんの人々の努力と思いと一緒に運べたらと思っています、宇宙で頑張っていきたいと思います、今までいっぱい支援してくれた家族も共に支援してくれた本当に皆さんに感謝申し上げたいと思います、行ってきます。Uh, hi, my name is Clayton Anderson, and uh, I'm MS-5 on this mission and the second spacewalker. I've had the opportunity to fly a long-duration mission in space, and now I'm being afforded the privilege of flying a short-duration mission. And throughout those processes, I've been able to understand just how many wonderful, talented, and professional people are throughout this agency that we call NASA. I'd like to thank each and every one of them for all the things they do, for their hard work, their dedication, and their tireless support. And I'd also like to remind them that uh, although one day we'll all become part of the history of NASA, we're always part of her future. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you for joining us here at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida for Space Shuttle Discovery's STS-131 L-4 Countdown Status Briefing. Joining me today is NASA Test Director Jeremy Graber. Good morning. STS-131 Payload Manager Joe DeLai. Good morning. And Shuttle Weather Officer Kathy Winters. Good morning. We'll hear from the panelists and then we'll take some questions. Jeremy. Thanks, Kandria. Uh, good morning. It's great to be here to talk about STS-131's launch countdown and all of our preparations. Uh, our team's here at Kennedy Space Center and at all our centers around the country uh, have been working real hard to get STS-131 ready to go. Uh, all of our preparations for launch countdown are complete and uh, we're, we're no working no issues at this time. Um, some of our significant launch countdown preparations. Uh, last week uh, we completed our ordnance installation and on Friday this past week, we closed out the orbiter aft compartment and uh, installed the aft compartment doors. Let's see, we finished our final pressurization of our orbiter maneuvering system and our main propulsion system uh, high pressure tanks, and that was completed uh, yesterday morning with no issues. Our STS 131 flight crew, crew arrived early this morning, as you know, and uh, Dex and his crew are very excited to be here. Uh, they just completed their inspection of the <coughs> mid body and the payload out at Pad A, and uh, now that they're complete with that, we'll be finishing up our closeouts and closing payload bay doors for flight uh, later this afternoon. And finally, the uh, SGS-131 launch countdown pretest briefing is going on as we speak. Uh, our launch director, Pete Nikolenko, and shuttle test director, Steve Payne, are going through uh, the final uh, words about the launch countdown and going through it with the launch team. Let's see, for our significant launch countdown events over the next several days, uh, starting tomorrow morning at 2.30 in the morning, we'll pick up with our call to stations and the countdown clock will start counting at 3 a.m. After that, we'll proceed right into uh, checkout and configuration of Discovery's avionics systems and we'll also proceed with uh, additional vehicle and ground system checks. Uh, late tomorrow night, we'll uh, pick up with our loading of our 
onboard liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen tanks, and those are used for the electrical power generation system on board, and that will continue well into Saturday afternoon. And then let's see, on Saturday afternoon, we'll, once we get back into the pad, we'll pick up with our space shuttle main engine checkouts and additional pad configuration for launch. Early Sunday morning, we'll pick up with a checkout of Orbiter and Ground Communications Network. That's at 3.30 in the morning. Uh, later in the morning, uh, we will retract the rotating service structure, and that, that's set for 9.30 in the morning. And our external tank loading is uh, set to start no earlier than uh, just before 9 p.m., 8.56 p.m. on a Sunday afternoon. Let's see, as we proceed through the night, uh, early Sunday morning, we'll pick up with uh, the flight crew insertion, and that's uh, just after 3 in the morning leading up to launch. Uh, our launch window is our standard 10-minute window, uh, and it opens at 6.16 a.m. on Monday, April 5th. And as always, we generally target the middle of the window, which correlates to 6.21 a.m. on Monday morning. Uh, as far as the mission goes, this is a 13-day mission with uh, one contingency day and two weather contingency days. Uh, our end of mission landing is planned for KSE at 8.35 a.m. on Sunday, April 18th with a, as of uh, April 5th launch day. And uh, if we use that contingency day, uh, it would be at 9 a.m. on Monday, April 19th. Uh, and in summary, all of our vehicle and ground systems are ready. Uh, Dex and his crew, Discovery, and our entire launch team are all ready to proceed. And we're all really looking forward to getting into the SGS-131 launch countdown and leading to a great start of a Monday morning with the launch of Discovery at 6.21 a.m. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Joe? Okay. Thank you. Good morning. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, we're all excited about this mission, and we're looking forward to a beautiful launch. The pressurized module and the ammonia tank are ready to go to space. So we'll be carrying up to orbit various storage racks, science racks, and science middecks to continue our support of uh, ISS. So tomorrow at 10 o'clock, I'll give a detailed brief on our payloads. I look forward to talking to you then. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy. Thank you. Well, weather looks very good the next few days. Weather's very great for our uh, pre-launch operations, including for the RSS retract on Sunday and the tanking operation Sunday evening. And, uh, and we're even going to get up to about 80 degrees this weekend, so it's really going to be nice. Temperatures on launch morning are going to be in the, the low to mid-60s and uh, maybe in the upper 50s in some inland areas for anybody who happens to be watching the launch. And weather looks uh, very promising for launch as well. The only concern we have is just a slight concern for fogs or low cloud ceiling, but there's uh, really just a slight chance for this. So we're right now going with a 20% chance of KSC weather prohibiting launch. So let's go ahead and look at the satellite picture. You can see from the satellite picture, we do have really great weather here at Kennedy Space Center. High pressure's built in over Florida. We're just having a warming conditions. So the weather keeps improving. The winds have really come down. And so we're going to have a great week here um, the rest of this week and also into the weekend. And really, weather does look pretty good overall for, for Monday morning as well. Going into our tanking forecast, you can see weather looks very good for tanking. Scattered skies, winds are light from the southeast with a temperature of 68 degrees, so we have a 0% chance of KSE weather prohibiting tanking. For our launch forecast, weather looks pretty good overall. Uh, we're just going with a chance for a ceiling and also just some fog in the area. With that, we're just going with a 20% chance of that. Overall, what we really think overall is the most likely conditions is just few clouds at 3,000 feet, winds from the southeast at five knots, and visibility unrestricted. So 20% chance of prohibiting launch. For SRV recovery, weather looks great, just scattered skies out there, winds again from the southeast, five knots, and seas one to two feet, so great conditions out there with water temperatures um, being at 73 degrees. Nice weather. For our abort landing sites in the U.S., we do have a chance for showers within 30 nautical miles at Edwards, and Spaceflight Meteorology Group is forecasting great weather also at Northrop, so overall pretty good weather, just a slight concern at Edwards. And for, for the uh, overseas abort landing sites, Spaceflight Meteorology Group is forecasting great weather at all three locations. It's just a little bit windy at Istris, but not any kind of constraint violation there. Now, if we do happen to delay 24 hours, weather looks very similar here at Kennedy Space Center. Still looking at just scattered skies and winds uh, do shift a little bit more from the southwest. Again, just a slight concern for some fog or low ceilings, and with that, a 20% chance of KSC weather prohibiting launch. And for the abort landing sites, weather looks good at both Edwards and at Northrop. 
And for the overseas aboard landing sites, we again have another good day with uh, good weather forecast by Space Flight Meteorology Group at all three sites. And if we happen to delay 48 hours, just a little bit more of a concern today on this day, Wednesday of next week. We are more concerned this day about a ceiling coming into the area. Winds get a little bit stronger from the south also, 10 peaking to 15 knots. Primary concern being a ceiling in the area with a 40% chance of KSC weather prohibiting launch. And for the abort landing sites here in the U.S., the weather looks good for both Edwards and for Northrop. And for the overseas landing sites, so the weather does degrade on this day at both Zaragoza and Istris with a chance for showers at Zaragoza within 20 nautical miles and also a ceiling at Istris of 2,000 feet with a chance of showers within 20 nautical miles. Weather does look good, though, at Marone. So overall, we're looking for a very promising weather here at Kennedy Space Center. Great pre-launch weather. Should be a nice morning and uh, overall a 20 percent chance of KSC weather prohibiting launch. Thank you, Kathy. We'll now take some questions. If the microphone comes your way, please state your name, affiliation, and to whom you're addressing your question. Do I have any? Ken, please. Hi, Ken Kramer for uh, Space Flight Magazine and the Planetary Society. For Jeremy, please. You had some issues with the helium uh, valves. Can you describe how you resolved that and, and the flight rationale, please? Well, the, all the technical experts have gone through, and, and we've had multiple reviews talking about the, the helium ISO valve. And, you know, in, in general terms, essentially, we are in the proper configuration for flight. Um, the helium valve is failed in the open position, which is the way we would fly normally. Um, the issue comes in if we had subsequent failures of multiple other components then this valve would not be available to use as an isolation valve. The teams have gone through and looked at the failure history of all the other components. They've looked at other um, operations that would have to take place should those failures occur. There's multiple, multiple flight rules that allow them to uh, do uh, several things to keep the, the mission going as planned. And they've all agreed that there's no issue and the flight rationale has been accepted and, and we're in a great configuration to go fly. From a launch countdown perspective, again, it's in the right configuration for us, so it has no impact on launch countdown. If I could follow up with Joe, please. Can you just um, tell us uh, the science and stowage racks, where will they be placed in the uh, space station? Okay, we'll, we'll go through all that tomorrow, but we're flying up, um, you know, 16 racks total. Okay, so there's going to be um, what I call um, various stowage racks very science racks and then um, they're going to be stowed just it just depends on what the racks are that we stowed some in, in JAXA some in the lab some in node but uh, we'll go through all that tomorrow but I hope that answers your question thanks are there any other questions that will conclude today's L-4 countdown status briefing. As a reminder, the official countdown clock will begin at 3 a.m. Eastern Time tomorrow morning. Please join us here on NASA Television for the L-3 countdown status briefing at 10 a.m. Eastern tomorrow. For more information on the STS-131 mission and crew, visit www.nasa.gov slash shuttle. Thank you.
It moves away, right? It moves away. It backs straight up. Okay. It's On the surrounding track. building. Right. The surrounding building is still there with the ceiling. Oh. Okay. That feels... That'll come up, the tear title will come up. So there's a couple messages we'll get through that one. You're being paged. Oh. You said message. I don't know how they lifted it in or something. That's why I allowed it. Looking on your tank from this side. Hold no. number one. Green.
Good morning. Thank you for joining us here at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida for Space Shuttle Discovery's STS-131 L-3 Countdown Status Briefing. Joining me today is NASA Test Director Steve Payne. Good morning. STS-131 Payload Manager Joe DeLai. Good morning. And Shuttle Weather Officer Kathy Winters. Good morning. We'll hear from our panelists and then we'll take questions. Steve. Good. Thank you, Kendria. It's uh, always good to be back here uh, to give you a brief on the STS-131 launch countdown status. As you know, Discovery is going to be transporting a multipurpose logistics module, Leonardo, up to the station. It's going to be filled with science utilization and equipment racks, as well as an ammonia tank assembly uh, that will deliver. A countdown began this morning. Uh, we had our call to stations at 2.30, and the clock started at 3 o'clock this morning. Preparations are going extremely well. There are no uh, issues to report at this moment, and preparations continue in work. Today we're going to spend most of the morning uh, working on checkout and configuration of the avionic systems, and then pick up with preparations for our reactant load later on this evening. We'll clear the pad tonight at 7 p.m. for pyrotechnic system checks. We'll change our purge air from, uh, from air to gaseous nitrogen to inert the vehicle's mid-body, and begin reactant servicing just after midnight, at half past midnight. We'll do that all night long, and once the pad reopens at about 6.30 on Saturday morning, we'll begin the offload of 645 pounds of liquid oxygen from the reactant system. Uh, it is not required for a vehicle equipped with the station-to-shuttle power transfer system. We don't need to carry that much reactant up, and so we offload what we don't need. This uh, extends our hold time for an additional five hours at that point. We'll press on with pad configuration during the rest of the day. We'll demate umbilicals and begin preparations for external tank loading. Our T-11 hour hold is scheduled to begin at new day on Sunday. Check out of the orbiter and ground communication systems uh, is planned for Sunday morning starting at 3.30. Final flight crew and equipment stow starts at 5.30 and continues through about 10.30 this morning, or on Sunday morning. At 9.30 on Sunday morning, we'll rotate back the rotating service structure and begin final crew module configuration for launch. Uh, just before 2 o'clock on Sunday afternoon, the countdown clock will resume our count at 11 o'clock, at T minus 11 rather, and we'll begin final load preparations and start clearing the pad at about 4 p.m. Uh, earliest tanking time is going to be 8.56 p.m. on Sunday night. We expect the flight crew to be going out to the pad just before 3 o'clock in the morning on Monday morning. We have a 10-minute launch window. Actually, it's a little longer. It's uh, 13 minutes because we have both flight day 3 and flight day 4 opportunities on our first day. Uh, this gives us about uh, 3 minutes and 15 seconds on the first day additional time. We have hold time sufficient, uh, 4 days of liquid oxygen and 12 days of liquid hydrogen to give us 4 attempts in 5 days, which is our standard uh, uh, configuration. We have launch opportunities starting on the 5th and going through 14 April, at which point we have a beta angle cutout, which keeps us on the ground through the end of the month, and we could start again on the 29th uh, Kennedy time. Uh, we have planned, uh, a scrub turnaround plan is to do a couple of attempts, uh, go into our PRSD top-off to reload our, our liquid oxygen tanks. It takes 72 hours in this case because of the additional hold time required to offload. 
and then try again on the other side of the PRSD top off. This is a 13 day mission. We have one contingency day and two weather contingency days should we need them. Our end of mission is planned for 8.29 a.m. on Sunday, April 18th. The time changed a little bit from yesterday's brief. Uh, if we had to take the second rev, it would be 10.05 would be our second opportunity for that day. Uh, at this point in the count, since it's still early, uh, all systems are in great shape. Our launch countdown is going very well. And our STS-131 flight crew, which arri who arrived here uh, yesterday, or actually two days ago now, uh, and the launch team, they're ready. We're very proud of the hard work that they've been doing here at Kennedy and at other NASA centers around the country to get this mission ready. And we're eager to get Discovery flying on Monday morning. That's it for me. Thank you. Joe? Thanks, Andrea. Well, good morning. Welcome. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. Uh, we're very excited about this mission as we're approaching uh, assembly complete for the ISS, next few missions. Uh, we've been working on this pay payload for a long time, and our uh, payload is, is ready to go for launch. So we're going to go into a small presentation. Okay, so next few minutes, I'll go ahead and explain the payloads, the uh, storage experiments, the mid decks that I'll be flying on, on this mission. Uh, flight day three, of course, is the docking, and flight day four, we'll install the MPLM, and then flight day seven, we'll install the uh, ATA on the S1 truss. We have an MPL MPLM with 16 racks and aft end cone storage that weighs 26,800 uh, pounds. Of course, we have our ATA that weighs almost 3,900 pounds. And we're bringing up uh, 6,900 pounds of, of cargo. Okay, this is a great picture of our KSC team, which is composed of NASA, Boeing, and our Italian friends, in which we're integrating and testing the pressurized module. And this is a great shot of the inside of the module. You're looking from the hatch going in, into the module. You can actually see some of the science racks and uh, the storage racks. Okay, this, this should look familiar. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the 16 racks that are in the module. We have 11 storage, four utilization racks, and the utilization racks will support the ongoing science on ISS, and of course we have one crew quarters rack. So here's a nice picture of the crew quarters rack. You can see it from the outside, and you can see it from the inside, and it's really the size of a, of a large refrigerator with, a, with all the comforts of home for when the, crew's, uh, when the crew member's sleeping. Okay, we have the Marez. So of course we have to keep our astronauts in, in tip-top shape. So we're gonna carry up the muscle atrophy research and exercise system called the Marez. And of course this will be used for research on the uh, musculoskeletal system to better understand the effects of microgravity on the muscular system. Express Rack 7 is a standard payload rack system that has been streamlined um, this streamlines the process of transporting to and storing and supporting experiments on the ISS. Okay, Melfi, which is the minus 80 degree laboratory freezer for the ISS. Um, this has flown three times. It's a European Space Agency built NASA operated freezer and it stores samples on ISS to as low as the minus 80 degrees. Okay, the WARF, this is called the Window Observation Research Facility, and this is kind of unique. It provides the capability by which the payloads can perform Earth and space science research at the U.S. science window that is on the uh, Destiny Lab, and it uses the highest quality optics ever flown on, on a human-occupied spacecraft. So it's a, basically a special window, and the WARF rack will be mounted over that optical quality science window, and it only provides the necessary access to the window itself but also provides power, data, and cooling connections required for some of the science experiments that are going to be operating in front of the window. And uh, this is a picture of our aft end cone storage, and this allows us to bring up about 400 additional pounds of, of cargo to support the uh, crew on ISS. Okay, this is a picture of our ammonia tank assembly. This is on our external carrier. And there's about 300 pounds of ammonia each tank, so a total of 600 pounds. And the ammonia tank will be transferred to S1 truss, and then we'll, we, then we'll take the uh, old tank back and refurbish it and get it ready for ULF-6. And of course, the ammonia is used as part of the cooling system of the radiators on ISS. And this is the picture of the team 
perform, perform in their nominal integration of testing of the ammonia tank on its external carrier. Okay, so let me talk just a little bit about some of the science mid decks that we're going to be carrying up. So the top picture is, is Glacier, and this is a cryogenic uh, freezer refrigerator designed to provide transportation and preservation capability for various samples. And the bottom one is Merlin, and it's an incubator refrigerator designed to provide thermal control for temp temperature sensitive experiments. Okay, the top one called the Apex Cambium, which is the Advanced Plant Experiments Cambium. There's actually two plant experiments in this. The Cambium and what is also called the uh, Taja system. So the Cambium seeks uh, definitive evidence that gravity has a direct effect on the Cambium cells which contribute to the reaction of wood formation in trees. So that's going to be interesting. And the second one, STL, is a space tissue loss experiment. Um, there are actually two experiments sponsor sponsored by the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. And the purpose is to study um, cellular effects in microgravity for immune systems and direct tissue regeneration. And exposure to microgravity will cause the cells to react kind of similar to the way um, a wound would, would, uh, would act on the human body. Okay, the top one, the NLP Vaccine 8, is a commercial payload in support of the National Pathfinder initiative that contains pathogenic op uh, organisms which are being examined to develop potential vaccines for prevention of infections here on Earth. And the BRIC-16 is actually a KSC, a Kennedy Space Center experiment, which studies plants, and we can see which are the best plants that will, uh, we can use in orbit, f again, for long-term space flight. Okay, the top is called Space C. This is a JAXA experiment un under microgravity environment on ISS. This will yield important and um, uh, useful information for improving the uh, productivity of crops in space. Again, long-term space flight. And the bottom picture called the Neuro Experiment. This is, again, a JAXA experiment, and it will conduct experiments on uh, nanomaterials. Okay, so real quick, at Kennedy Space Center, you know, besides integrating payloads and, and launching rockets, we have two modern labs that will allow us and the customer to integrate and test their experiments. The first building called the um, Space Life Science Lab, we call the SLSL. This facility has 33 labs and allow the customer to work on their experiments in a controlled environment. It has chambers to, that can simulate the uh, on orbit environment so they can run the ground control in parallel with the uh, flight unit, the flight experiment on orbit. And then the Space Station Processing Facility, we call the SSPF, is another facility in which the customer can also use to integrate and test their, uh, their payloads or experiments. What is unique about this facility is we have the capability to test um, with the uh, ISS or with the International Space Station interfaces. So what we're going to do now is we're going to watch about a minute and 20 second video, and it's going to show you some of our customers working in the labs, and I'll try to point out some of the experiments they're working on. So. Enjoy. <laughs> so what you're going to see here is you're going to see a uh, video of various experiments that are being processed at KSC. I, I think the first one is, is, is the STL experiment we talked about early. And um, again, they're going to study of microgravity on, on muscles. And you're going to see the Myro and Neurolab. And the Myro is a study of microgravity on muscles, and Neurolab is the effects of radiation on humans. The customers come to Kennedy Space Center, they're integrating their experiment, they're testing their experiment, they want to make sure it works as a unique experiment, and then they'll test against the uh, International Space Station interfaces that we have here and make sure it works with ISS, and then once it's on ISS, the ISS will perform its experiment, and if needed, they can perform a, in parallel uh, a ground, uh, a similar operation on the ground. So you can compare the effects on, in space, and you can compare the effects on gravity in parallel. Mm. Exactly. You see we have a lot of JAXA folks in these experiments that are utilizing these labs.
course, the space station processing facility labs have been here for a while. We just renovated them. And the SLSL has been here, I think, since around, we'll say, early to mid-2000s. Uh, I think it was 2004, 2005. Okay, so that concludes my presentation. I, po I, I uh, hope you enjoyed it and enjoy this launch. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy. Well, weather is looking very good right now at KSC. We've been uh, experiencing some really nice weather. It's going to continue into launch day. The only concern we do have is for fog to form the morning of launch. And right now we're forecasting a wind from the east. It's very light, though, and if it happens to turn around and give us a land breeze, the temperatures could drop enough to saturation and cause some fog in the area. And we do have a four nautical mile, uh, or a four mile constraint, a visibility constraint for our, uh, return to launch site weather. So that's our primary concern for launch. And right now we're going with a 20% chance of that occurring. So let's go ahead and look at the satellite picture. You can see we do have just beautiful weather here today. Expected to get up to 78 degrees here on the coast. Uh, just nice high pressure areas built in off to our northeast with a ridge extending out over Florida. And so just excellent weather for us uh, the next couple of days for all of our pre-launch processing and coming up to launch. Looking at our tanking forecast, you can see the weather does look very good for that. Uh, just scattered skies, winds from the east peaking to 12 knots. So we have a 0% chance of KSC weather prohibiting tanking. Launch morning should be nice overall. The main concern is just if some fog did happen to form in the area. If our winds stay from the east, that won't occur. It's only if a land breeze would set up um, back at the SLF. And if that happens to occur, uh, that's when we'd have concern for fog. And so with that, we have a 20% chance of KSC weather prohibiting launch. For our SRB recovery weather, it looks very good out there at the SRB recovery area. Seas just two to three feet. Winds are five to 10 knots from the east. For our abort landing sites, Space Flight Meteorology Group is forecasting chance for showers within 30 nautical miles at Edwards, but good weather at Northrop Field. And for our overseas abort, overseas abort landing sites, Space Flight Meteorology Group has good weather all three days at all, all, excuse me, for all three locations on launch day. If we do happen to delay 24 hours, uh, we are expecting very similar conditions here at Kennedy Space Center. Our primary concern this day will be fog or um, also possibly a low cloud ceiling. A little bit less chance for fog this day, a little more chance for a ceiling. Uh, so with that, we just went ahead and went with a 20% chance of KSC weather prohibiting launch. Space Flight Meteorology Group is forecasting good weather at both abort landing sites here in the U.S. And also for the overseas landing sites as well, good weather at all three locations. And if we happen to delay 48 hours, this day we have a little bit stronger winds from the southeast, peaking up to about 15 knots. We would not expect fog to form in those kind of uh, conditions, but we do have a better chance for a ceiling on this day. So with that, we have a 40% chance of KSC weather prohibiting launch. The abort landing sites are good again on day, on day three for our sites in the United States. And Space Light Meteorology Group is forecasting good weather at all three uh, towel sites also for the 48-hour delay. We do have a ceiling expected at Zaragoza, but it's not a constraint violation. So overall, our primary concern for launch is fog um, obscuring visibility in the area. And with that, we have a 20% chance of KSC weather prohibiting launch. Thank you. We'll now take questions. When the microphone comes your way, please state your name, affiliation, and to whom you're addressing your question. Bill. Bill Harwich, CBS. Uh, one payload question, just to make sure I understand uphill mass. Uh, the press kit, their value for the MPLM is, I believe, when you subtract the weight of the MPLM, it's like 17,000 pounds. What, can you break down the what you gave us a 6,000 pound thing? I'm just trying to make sure I understand that the numbers add up. Okay, yeah, what I mentioned earlier was the the MPLM itself, with all the cargo and racks and science in it, was, I think, 26,800 pounds. We have about 6,900 pounds of just cargo. Okay, so that would exclude the racks, you know, the science racks, and exclude the storage racks. Okay, thank you. Thanks. And for Steve, on the scrub turnaround, can you explain how that plays with Atlas? Because I, I guess that's, you guys have talked to them, right, about what yes. you're going to do? We have, usually we're worried about other rockets being on the range at the same time we're trying to launch. We don't have that this time. However, at the time we're trying to land, the Atlas V rocket uh, is scheduled for the 19th currently. Uh, is within a day of our scheduled landing, and that doesn't work out as far as with range reconfiguration. So what we've done is we've uh, we've arranged with them that we'll try two attempts 
And since we have to top off our PRSD at some point, we'll stand down at that point, do our 72-hour top off. By the time we come back, we're on the other side of their launch and there's no conflict. So that, that worked out for us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Chris Gephardt with NASASpaceFlight.com with the one payload question. Um, in terms of the mid-deck payloads, um, are there any time constraints? Um, if we get into scrub turnaround of any experiments, you'd have to go and swap out? Yeah, good question. So we have a, a lot of mid-decks on this flow. We have three waves of teams working it. There's, I think, five plus, so there's two powered, and the rest are uh, non-powered. So yeah, you know, it really depends on, on, mm -hmm. on what the actual scenario is, whether you scrub 24 hours or 48 or 96 or, or four days. Each, each mid-deck has its uh, own unique requirements. So each, each mid-deck could, you know, some mid-decks could stay there f the whole time. You may have to change three or four out after 24 hours. It just depends on the actual mid-deck. But we are prepared for all the different scenarios. Thanks. James. James Dean from Florida today, one, one for Steve, one for Kathy, I think. Uh, Steve, just big picture, four missions to go. Um, could you just talk about the significance of this mission in the context of, you know, what we've got left to do on station, um, getting it completed, ready to uh, okay. keep six crew as long as we can until the next vehicles are ready, that, that type of thing. Yeah. Well, some of that I'm, I'm sure I could throw at Joe as far as the, the, the status of station assembly and, and where we are. Uh, every one of the remaining missions is an important mission for us because because we only have a few left. We have to get everything that we're going to get uphill on these next few missions. Uh, this one carries a lot of the experiment racks that we have all this laboratory space awaiting for these racks, so we're going to be taking them up. Uh, and a lot of the heavy lift has to be carried up on shuttles, so we're taking advantage of all that. Uh, for us, since we only have a few left, we're, we're savoring everything we have because these are very special to us. And as you know, the team out here really loves launching space shuttles. Uh, so we're enjoying everything we can while we got it. Uh, it's, it's, each one is a, is a big event for us, and we really enjoy this. And uh, Kathy, I guess we have a, a, a bonus night launch here that we weren't uh, anticipating last mission. Can you just kind of paint the picture if, uh, you know, fog doesn't become uh, an obstacle, um, what, what it'll look like uh, less than an hour before sunrise there? Um, yeah, actually, it should. I, I meant to mention this. I'm glad you, you said that we were talking about this uh, yesterday. It should be um, kind of interesting. I think what's going to happen is as the vehicle launches, it's dark here, but you know we're only um, we're less than an hour before sunrise, and about 15 to 20 minutes before beginning morning um, civil twilight. And so I think what's going to happen is as the sh as the vehicle gets up high, it actually may get some sunlight on it. And so that would actually cause like a nice reflection of the sun off the vehicle, and you could really see it brightly. Then after launch, the, the sun will begin to rise. And as that's occurring, you're going to see the colorful plume, I think, um, occur, where the plume will be lingering in the area. The sun will start hitting it as, it as it's beginning to rise or come over the horizon. And of course, in the top part of the plume will light up first, and it'll just turn all those rainbow colors that we can get sometimes when we have launches around dawn and dusk. So it should be a really, I think, a beautiful sight. I'm hoping that the visibility holds out for us for that. Marcia. Um, Marcia Den, Associated Press for Steve. Do you intend to use those extra three minutes if you need it in, for the flight day for rendezvous? Yes, we've, uh, we've already discussed it, and for every opportunity we have it, we're going to use every last minute of window we have. So the flight day fours are fair game for every shot. Thank you. And, and for Joe, um, any last minute payloads going on board? And um, is there something for the water processing assembly this time again? So as far as the MPLM and the ammonia tank, no, there are no last minutes. But um, in the mid-deck, you know, this usually happens when you have issues on orbit. You know, sometimes, it, you know, a few days before launch or something happens, you may have to put a few things in the mid-deck. So, yeah, they're going to, they're going to, um, they've sent down some seals for the water processing unit. And they're here at KSC, and they're going to be stowed on a mid-deck. I'm not quite sure when they're stowing it. Um, probably tomorrow, we'll say. And um, just, yeah, so basically seals are sent from JSC. We'll receive McKendy. We'll stow them on, on the mid-deck, and it'll support the, uh, you know, some of the water issues they've had on orbit. Uh, one, other th one other item that they're sent down is what they call a TVIS bracket. A TVIS is the, what I call the shock absorbing system for the exercises, uh, exercise equipment. So when you're using the treadmill up there or any of the exercise equipment, you, want, you don't want to impart loads onto station, so they have like a shock absorber system called the TVIS. And um, we're going to set up an extra bracket 
that supports that. And that's really about it. It's kind of just standard stuff. Thank you. Come in, please. Uh, Jim Siegel, Celebration Independent Newspaper. I have two questions for Joe. Uh, first of all, I'm interested in telling my readers a little bit about the, the kinds of experiments uh, or payloads uh, that are going up on this fight that are going to directly benefit people back down here on Earth as opposed to uh, understanding uh, space travel and, and, uh, and, uh, and existing in space. So I thought I heard you mention a couple of those. Could you run through those again, perhaps, and what other ones might be benefiting directly uh, people here on Earth? I think the one that comes to my mind is what I mentioned earlier is the NPL vaccine. So the, uh, the crew members are going to be working with the NPL vaccine mid-deck. And again, this is going to uh, research in a microgravity environment different vaccines that can be used for various reasons down here. So that's probably the first thing that comes to my mind. The second thing that comes to my mind is if you take a look at all the muscle um, research that we've been doing, the different muscle uh, experiments. Yeah, you know, it's, it, it's for long, it's for long term space flight, but it has a benefit here on Earth. The, the more you study how uh, astronauts can adapt themselves to long term space flight when it comes to muscle de deterioration, bone loss, really the first derivative is osteoporosis. There's so many benefits that can come from that in the study of osteoporosis, and we've been doing that for years. So those are probably the two things that come to my mind. Thank you. Thank you. And then one other question for you. Um, my understanding is that, that if necessary, there is enough uh, hardware to do uh, another launch that is currently not on the books, not scheduled. If, if that were the case, are there uh, experiments or payloads that are kind of waiting out there for just in case there's room to, to be able to send something up? Well, I'm not familiar with anything directly. You know, we have our next, next few launches and everything has been manifested. And of course, we go through a nominal, nominal process. Things get manifested and things get remanifested. Uh, as, far as, as far as an extra flight, I'm, I'm not familiar with anything that just, that, that, that's kind of waiting right now. But again, you know, anything can change. So thank you. James. James in Florida today. I see if, uh, I guess the crew is asleep now. I'm not sure of their, their hours exactly. Um, but can you give us a rough idea of kind of their, their schedule and what activities they're up to when, when they're awake? Frankly, I don't have that information with me at the moment, but we can get that to you. They, they have the crew schedule somewhere, I'm sure. We'll get that for you. Yeah. <laughs> Chris. Um, Chris Gephardt with NASASpaceFlight.com again. Um, the ammonia tank assembly that's gone up on Discovery, is that the same ammonia tank that was brought back on 128 for refurbishment? Exactly. And then we're going to refurbish. So this is going to go up there, and this will stay on um, the S1 Trust. They'll take the one that's up there now, bring it back, we'll refurbish that, and it'll go on ULF-6, and then it'll permanently stay up there. So good knowledge. Thanks. <laughs> Jim, you have a follow-up? Um, I have a question about uh, the, the shuttle vehicles. Uh, the next three launches after this one is going to be the last flight, I believe, for each one of the vehicles. So is there anything special that you're going to do to prepare those three vehicles for these upcoming flights that you might not ordinarily do, considering that it might be their last flights? I don't think we're doing anything different or special. We go to great lengths to prepare each one for each mission. Uh, we're not certainly not doing any less than we would normally. Uh, for the last flight, uh, when we send them out the door to fly, they're as clean as we could possibly make them, so I expect we'll do exactly the same as we do for all the others. Are there any other questions? Well, that will conclude today's L-3 countdown status briefing. Please join us here on NASA television tomorrow for the pre-launch news conference, which is set to begin no earlier than 11.30 a.m. Eastern. For more information on the STS-131 mission and crew, visit www.nasa.gov slash shuttle. Thank you.
It was a time of progress and pride, and today it's hard to give that up. Some hope the shuttle's life will be extended, a question we put to NASA chief and former astronaut Charles Bolden. Quite a few of the people we've spoken to have said, well, maybe no. there'll be a few more flights. No. I don't think so. I, you know, we, um, it is time to move on. It's incredibly important for NASA to, uh, to try to get to the point where we can begin to explore again. <laughs> But in the meantime, he's facing fury over the scrapping of the shuttle's successor, Constellation. I was insufficiently prepared to lay the groundwork for rolling out uh, the president's vision and plan. NASA veterans feel bewildered and betrayed. I feel terrible. Why? Uh, because we're going into a dark ages as far as I'm concerned. China, I think, will be the number one in space, and we're going to be down here looking at the Chinese communist flag on the moon. It takes us out of any leadership role in the human space uh, program, and I don't think we can cede that role to, to anyone. I don't think we dare. These men have made space their life. After the shuttle, the next generation wants to know how it will make a living. More than 300 Americans have launched into space on the shuttle. We're coming to the end of an era, and the economic impact is being felt all around us on what Floridians are proud to call America's Space Coast. The community of Titusville has lived off the shuttle. Now it's in decline, about to lose 9,500 jobs in the space industry and as many as 20,000 more in the firms that feed it. Even at the annual Taste of Titusville celebration, we found the mood was fragile. I think it's gonna be very scary. It's gonna be like a ghost town in Titusville and that's a shame. There's gonna be a slump. There's definitely gonna be an economic downturn. This is Miracle City Mall. And at one time, this was full of stores. The president of the Titusville Chamber of Commerce is praying for a new flow of private sector business. We have been leaders in the the space race for so long that it's easy to forget to be hungry and um, we have to be hungry we, we have to be hungry for new business we've been here 27 years for Loralee like Marsha the only way is forward just as she thrives on selling shrimp to hungry customers she's eager to sell the beauties of the Space Coast to tourists we have a lot of really unique things here that we just haven't done a very good job of marketing because we haven't had to. We're just going to have to work a little bit harder now. It's tough to say goodbye to the shuttle. The message from the White House is it's time to move on. Philippa Thomas, BBC News, Florida.